Section 1 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various alcohol in nature its presence in the earth water and atmosphere a chemist of merit mr a muntz who has already made himself known by important labors and by analytical researches of great precision has been led to a very curious and totally unexpected discovery on the subject of which he has kindly given us information in detail which we place before our readers mr muntz has discovered that arable soil waters of the ocean and streams, and the atmosphere contain traces of alcohol, and that this compound formed by the fermentation of organic matters is everywhere distributed throughout nature. We should add that only infinitesimal quantities are involved, reaching only the proportion of millions, yet the fact, for all that, offers a no less powerful interest. The method of analysis which has permitted the facts to be shown is very elegant and scrupulously exact and is worthy of being made known mr muntz's method of procedure is as follows he submits to a distillation three or four gallons of snow rain or sea water in an apparatus the part which serves as a boiler and which holds the liquid to be distilled is a milk can the vapors given off through the action of the heat circulate through a leaden tube some thirty-three feet in length and then traverse a tube enclosed within a refrigerating cylinder which is kept constantly cold by a current of water they are finally condensed in a glass flask which forms the receiver when one hundred or one hundred fifty cubic centimeters of condensed liquid which contains all the alcohol are collected in the receiver the operations are suspended the liquid thus obtained is distilled anew in a second apparatus which is analogous to the preceding but much smaller the liquid is heated in the flask, and its vapor, after traversing a glass worm, is condensed in the tube. The operation is suspended as soon as five or six cubic centimeters of the condensed liquid have been collected in the test tube. The latter is now removed, and to its liquid contents there is added a small quantity of iodine and carbonate of soda. The mixture is slightly heated, and soon there are seen forming through precipitation small crystals of iodoform. Under such circumstances, iodoform could only have been formed through the presence of an alcohol in the liquid. These analytical operations are verified by Mr. Muntz as follows. He distills in the same apparatus three to four gallons of chemically pure distilled water, and ascertains positively that under these conditions iodine and carbonate of soda give absolutely no reaction. Finally, to complete the demonstration, and to ascertain the approximate quantity of alcohol contained in natural waters, he undertakes the double fractional distillation of a certain quantity of pure water to which he has previously added a one millionth part of alcohol. Under these circumstances, the iodine and carbonate of soda give a precipitate of iodoform exactly similar to that obtained by treating natural waters. In the case of arable soil, Mr. Muntz stirs up a weighted quantity of the material to be analyzed in a certain proportion of water, distills it in the smaller of the two apparatus, and detects the alcohol by means of the same operation as before. The formation of iodoform by precipitation under the action of iodine and carbonate of soda is a very sensitive test for alcohol. Iodoform has sharply defined characters which allow of its being very easily distinguished. Its crystalline form, especially, is entirely typical. Its color is pale yellowish, and when it is examined under the microscope, it is seen to be in the form of six-pointed stars precisely like the crystalline form of snow. Mr. Muntz has not been contented to merely submit the iodoform precipitates obtained by him to microscopical examination, but has preserved the aspect of his preparations by means of microphotography. The figures annexed show some of the most characteristic proofs. 
Figure 1 shows crystals of iodoform obtained with pure water to which one millionth part of alcohol had been added. Figure 2 exhibits the form of the crystals obtained with rainwater, and Figure 3 those with water. Figure 4 shows crystals obtained with arable soil or garden mold. The first of Mr. Muntz's experiments were made about four years ago, but since that time he has treated a great number of rain and snow waters collected both at Paris and in the country. At every distillation all the apparatus was cleansed by prolonged washing in a current of stream and in order to confirm each analysis a corresponding experiment was made like the one before mentioned more than eighty trials gave results which were exactly identical the quantity of alcohol contained in rain snow and sea waters may be estimated at from one to several millionths cold water and melted snow seem to contain larger proportions of it than tepid waters in the waters of the seine it was found in appreciable quantities and in sewage waters the proportions increase very perceptibly. Vegetable mold is quite rich in it. Indeed, it is quite likely that alcohol, in its natural state, has its origin in the soil through the fermentation of the organic matters contained therein. It is afterward disseminated throughout the atmosphere in the state of vapor, and becomes combined with the aqueous vapors whenever they become condensed. The results which we have just recorded are, as far as known to us, absolutely new they constitute a work which is entirely original which very happily goes to complete the history of the composition of the soil and atmosphere and which does great credit to its author la nature end of section one section two of scientific american supplement number two eighty eight july ninth eighteen eighty one this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Scientific American Supplement Number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Detection of Alcohol in Transparent Soaps by H. J. It appears that every article manufactured with the aid of alcohol is required on its introduction into France to pay duty on the supposed quantity of this reagent which has been used in its preparation. Certain transparent soaps of German origin are now met with, made, as is alleged, without alcohol, and the author proposes the following process for verifying this statement by ascertaining the presence or absence of alcohol in the manufactured article. Fifty grams of soap are cut into very small pieces and placed in a phial of 200 cc capacity. Thirty grams sulfuric acid are then added, and the phial is stoppered and agitated till the soap is entirely dissolved. The phial is then filled up with water, and the fatty acids are allowed to collect and solidify. The subnatant liquid is drawn off, neutralized, and distilled. The first 25 cc's are collected, filtered, and mixed according to the process of Messrs. Riche and Bardi for the detection of alcohol in commercial methylenes, with one half cc sulfuric acid at 18 degrees Beaumet, then with the same volume of permanganate, 15 grams per liter, and allowed to stand for one minute. He then adds eight drops of sodium hyposulfite at 33 degrees Beaumet, and one cc of a solution of magenta one decigram per liter. If any alcohol is present, there appears within five minutes a distinct violet tinge. The presence of essential oils gives rise to a partial reduction of the permanganate without affecting the conversion of alcohol into aldehyde. End of section two. Section 3 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. On the Calorific Power of Fuel and on Thompson's Calorimeter by J. W. Thomas. 
FCS, FIC. A simple experiment capable of yielding results which shall be at least comparative has long been sought after by large consumers of coal and artificial fuel abroad in order to ascertain the relative calorific power possessed by each description. As it is well known that the proportion of mineral matter and the chemical composition of coal differ widely, the determination of the ash in coal is not a highly scientific operation. Hence, it is not surprising that foreign merchants should have become alive to the importance of estimating its quality. While, however, the nature and quantity of the ash can be determined without much difficulty, the determination of the chemical composition of coal entails considerable labor and skill. Hence, the method giving the calorific power of any fuel in an exact and reliable manner by a simple experiment is a great desideratum. This will become more obvious when one takes into consideration the many qualities and variable characters of the coals yielded by the South Wales and North of England coal fields. Bituminous coals, giving some 65% of coke, are preferred for some manufacturing purposes, and in some markets. Bituminous steam coals, yielding 75% of coke, are highly prized in others. Semi-bituminous steam coals, yielding 80-83% to of coke, are most highly valued, and find the readiest sale abroad. An anthracite steam coal, dry coals, giving from 85-88% to of coke, using the term coke as equivalent to the non-volatile portion of the coal, is also exported in considerable quantity. Now, the estimation of the ash of any of these varieties of coals would afford no evidence as to the class to which that coal belongs, and there is no simple test that will give the calorific power of a coal, and at the same time indicate the degree of bituminous or anthracitic character which it possesses. In order to obtain such information, it is necessary that the percentage of coke be determined together with the sulfur, ash, and water, and these form data which at once show the nature of a fuel and give some indication of its value. To ascertain the quality of the sulfur, ash, and water with accuracy involves more skill and aptitude than can be bestowed by the non-professional public. The consequence is that experiments entailing less time and precision like those devised by Berthier and Thompson, have been tried more or less extensively. In France and Italy, Berthier's method, slightly modified in some instances, has long been used. It is as follows. 70 grams of oxide of lead, litharge, and 10 grams of oxychloride of lead are employed to afford oxygen for the combustion of 1 gram of fuel in a crucible. From the weight of the button of lead, and taking 8,080 units as the equivalent of carbon, the total heat units of the fuel is calculated. This experiment is very imperfect and erroneous upon scientific grounds, since the hydrogen of the fuel is scarcely taken into account at all. In the first place, hydrogen consumes only one quarter as much oxygen as carbon and furthermore, two-ninths only of the heating power of hydrogen is used as the multiplying number, viz. 8,080, while the value of hydrogen is 34,462. In other words, one-eighteenth only of the available hydrogen present in the fuel is shown in the result obtained. Apart from this, my experience of the working of Berthier's method has been by no means satisfactory. There is considerable difficulty in obtaining pure litharge, and it is almost impossible to procure a crucible which does not exert a reducing action upon the lead oxide. Some twelve months ago, I went out to Italy to test a large number of cargoes of coal with Thompson's calorimeter, and since then this apparatus has superseded Berthier's process and is likely to come into more general use. Like Berthier's method, Thompson's apparatus is not without its disadvantages, and the purpose of this paper is to set these forth, as well as to suggest a uniform method of working by means of which the great and irreconcilable differences in the results obtained by some chemists might be overcome. It has already been observed that a coal rich in hydrogen shows a low heating power by Berthier's method and it will become evident on further reflection that the higher the percentage of carbon 
the greater will be the indicated calorific power. In fact, a good sample of anthracite will give higher results than any other class of coal by Berthier's process. With Thompson's calorimeter, the reverse is the case, as the whole of the heating power of the hydrogen is taken into account. In short, with careful working, the more bituminous a coal is, the more certain it is that its full heating power shall be exerted and recorded, so far as the apparatus is capable of indicating it. For when the result obtained is multiplied by the equivalent of the latent heat of steam, the product is always below the theoretical heat units calculated from the chemical composition of the coal by the acid of Favre and Silberman's figures for carbon and hydrogen. On the other hand, when the heating power of coal low in hydrogen is determined by Thompson's calorimeter, much difficulty is experienced in burning the carbon completely. Hence, a low result is obtained. From a large number of experiments, I have found that when a coal does not yield more than 86% of coke, it gives its full comparative heating power, but it is very questionable if equal results will be worked out if the coke exceeds the above amount, although I have met with coals giving 87% of coke, which were perfectly manageable, though in other cases the coal did not burn completely. It will be noted that the non-volatile residue of anthracite is never as low as 86%, and this, together with the very dry steam coals and bastard anthracite, found over a not inextensive tract of the South Wales coal field, form a series of coals alike difficult to burn in Thompson's calorimeter. Considerable experience has shown that in no single instance was the true comparative heating power of anthracite or bastard anthracite indicated. With a view to accelerate the perfect combustion of these coals, sugar, starch, bitumen, and bituminous coals, substances rich in hydrogen were employed, mixing in varying proportions with the anthracitic coal, but without the anticipated effect. Coke was also treated in a like manner. Without enlarging further upon these futile trials, all carefully and repeatedly verified, the results of my experiments and experience show that for coals of an anthracitic character, yielding more than 87% of coke, or for coke itself, Thompson's calorimeter is not suited as an indicator of their comparative calorific power, for the simple reason that some of the carbon is so graphitic in its nature that it will not burn perfectly when mixed with nitrate and chloride of potash. A sample of very pure anthracite used in the experiments referred to gave 90.4% of non-volatile residue and only 0.84% of ash. This coal was not difficult to experiment with, as combustion started with comparative ease and proceeded quite rapidly enough. But in every instance, a portion of the carbon was unconsumed, and consequently, instead of about 13 degrees in rise of temperature, only 10 degrees were recorded. Since the calorific power of a coal is determined by the number of degrees Fahrenheit which a given quantity of water is raised in temperature by a known weight of fuel, it follows that every care should be taken that the experiment be performed under similar atmospheric conditions. The oscillation of barometric pressure does not appear to affect the working, but the temperature of the room in which the work was done, and especially that of the water, are most important considerations. It has been observed by some who have used this apparatus, and I have frequently noticed it myself, that the lower the temperature of the water is under which the fuel is burnt, the higher the result found. This has been explained on the assumption that the colder the water used, the greater is the difference between the temperature of the room and that of the water. Hence, it would be expedient that in all cases when such experiments are made, the same difference of temperature between the air in the room and the water employed should always exist. For example, if the temperature of the room were 70 degrees and the water at 60 degrees, then the same coal would give a like result with the water at 40 degrees and the room at 50 degrees. This has been regarded as the more evident, because the gases passing through the water escape under favorable conditions of working at the same temperature as the water, and are perfectly deprived of any heat in excess of that possessed by the water. 
Under these circumstances, it would seem only reasonable that this assumption should be correct. It was, however, found after a large number of experiments upon the same sample of coal that this was not the case. 30 grams of coal, which raises the temperature of the water 13.4 degrees, when the water at starting was 60 degrees and the room at 70 degrees, gives 13.7% rise of temperature with the water at 40 degrees and the room at 50 degrees. Conversely, when the water is at 70 degrees and the room at 80 degrees, a lower result is obtained. The explanation appears to be this. The gas which escapes from the water was not in existence in the gaseous form previous to the experiment, and the heat communicated to the gas being a definite quantity, it follows that the more the gas is cooled, the greater the proportion of chemical energy in the shape of heat will be utilized and recorded as calorific power. In order, therefore, to make the experiment more simple and workable at all temperatures, a sample of coal was selected, which should be perfectly manageable and readily consumed. Appended is an analysis of the coal employed, from Ebuvale, Monmouthshire. Composition Percent Carbon, 88.3 Hydrogen, 5.08 Oxygen, 3.28 Nitrogen, 0.55. Sulfur, 0 0.70. Ash, 1.26. Water, moisture, 0 0.80. Total, 100%. In the following experiments, the standard temperature of the water was taken as 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and as the coal gave 13.4 degrees of rise in temperature, 67 degrees Fahrenheit was selected as the standard room temperature. The reason for this room temperature is obvious, for whatever heating effect the higher temperature of the room may have upon the water in the cylinder during the time occupied by the first half of the experiment would be compensated for by the loss sustained during the second half of the experiment, when the temperature of the water exceeded that of the room. The mean of numerous trials gave 13.4 degrees Fahrenheit rise of temperature, equal to 14.74 pounds of water per pound of coal. When the water was at 50 degrees and the room at 57 degrees, the mean of several experiments gave 13.5 degrees rise of temperature. When the water was at 40 degrees at starting and the room at 47 degrees, 13.65 degrees was the average rise of temperature. Trials were made at intermediate temperatures, and the results always showed that higher figures were recorded when the water was coldest. With a view of getting uniformity in the results, it was thought well to make experiments in order to find out what temperature the room should be at so that this coal might give the same result with the water at 50 degrees, 40 degrees, or at intermediate temperatures. Without going much into detail, it was found that when the temperature of the room was at 40 degrees and that of the water 40 degrees, and the experiment was rapidly and carefully performed, 13.4 degrees rise of temperature was given. But this result could be obtained without special effort when the room was 42 degrees and the water 40 degrees at starting. It is evident that the cooling effect of the air in the room upon the water cylinder is very appreciable when the water has reached 13 degrees above that of the room. When the water was at 50 degrees and the room at 55 degrees, the coal gave 13.4 degrees rise with ease and certainty, and it would not be out of place to remark here that with those coals which burn well in Thompson's calorimeter, the results of several trials are remarkably uniform when properly performed. With the water at 70 degrees and the room at 80 degrees, a like result was worked out. Experiments at intermediate temperatures were also carried out. See table and sequel. It is true that the whole difference of temperature we are dealing with in making these corrections is only 0.25, but 0.2 in the result when multiplied by 537 to bring it into calories, as is done by the authorities in Italy, makes more than 100 heat units, a serious difference when 5d per ton fine is attached to every 100 calories lower than the number guaranteed. Taking the latent heat of steam as 537 degrees Celsius, 
and multiplying this number by 14.74, the evaporative power of the coal used in these experiments, its equivalent in calories is 7,915. From the analysis of this coal, disregarding the nitrogen and deducting an equivalent of hydrogen for the oxygen present, the total heat units given by Favre and Silberman's figures for carbon, 8,080, and hydrogen, 34,462, will be 8,746. It will be seen, therefore, that the calorific power, as determined by Thompson's apparatus, gives a much lower result when multiplied by 537 than the heat units calculated from the chemical composition of the coal. When I used Thompson's apparatus in the chemical laboratory at Turin to determine the evaporative power of various cargoes of South Wales coal, it was agreed by mutual consent that the temperature of the water at starting should be 39 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature at which the heat unit was determined. The temperature of the room was about 60 degrees, but this varied as the weather was somewhat severe and changeable. Under these conditions, with the water at 39 degrees and the room 60 degrees, the coal which gives 14.74 pounds of water per pound of coal will give as high as 15.88 pounds of water per pounds of coal. This result multiplied by 537, equaling 8,496 calories, approaching much more nearly to the theoretic value. This method of working is still practiced abroad, but experience has shown that very widely differing results follow when working in this manner, especially if the temperature of the room is changeable, as it naturally is where ash determinations and other chemical work is proceeding simultaneously. The time the experiment lasts, taking the reading on a quickly rising thermometer and other considerations, render the experiments anything but trustworthy when 0.2 of a degree makes a difference of more than 100 calories. In the instructions supplied with Thompson's calorimeter, nothing is said as to the temperature of the room in which the experiment is performed, but simply that the water shall be at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. If, with the water at 60 degrees, a room were at 50 degrees, as it often is in winter, a good coal would give 14 pounds of water per pound of coal as the evaporative power. But if in summer, the room were at 75 degrees and the water at 60 degrees, the same coal would give 15 pounds of water per pound of coal. If further evidence were needed of the effect of temperature consideration of the experiments already referred to will show how necessary it is that some general rule should be adopted. Considerable stress is laid in the instructions upon the quantity of oxygen mixture used being determined by rough experiments. This, I have found, leads to erroneous conclusions unless a number of experiments are tried in the calorimeter, as it often happens that the quantity which appears to be best adapted is not that which yields a trustworthy result. There are many samples of South Wales coal, 30 grains of which will require 10 parts of oxygen mixture in order to burn completely. But since a little oxygen is lost in drying and grinding, and few samples of chlorate are free from chloride, it is not safe to use less than 11 parts of oxygen mixture, but this amount is sufficient in all cases and never need be exceeded. I have made numerous experiments with various coals, anthracite, steam, semi-bituminous, and bituminous, including a specimen of the 10-yard coal of Derbyshire, and find that with 11 parts of chlorate and nitrate of potash, they are all perfectly manageable and yield the best results. It is clear that the excess of chlorate is decomposed in all instances, and the latent heat of the oxygen evolved, but those coals which are best to experiment with did not yield results that differed when the quantity of oxygen mixture was reduced to nearly the limit required for the combustion of the coal. Under these circumstances, therefore, the constant use of 11 parts of oxygen mixture, a suitable quantity for all coals exported, would enable operators to obtain similar figures, and make the test uniform in different hands. The following is a brief outline of the method of procedure recommended. 
Sample the coal until an average portion passes through a sieve having 64 meshes to the square inch. Take about 300 grains, 20 grams of this, and run through a brass wire gauze having 4,600 meshes to the square inch, taking care that the whole sample selected is thus treated. One part of nitrate of potash and three parts of chlorate of potash, dry, are separately ground in a mortar and repeatedly sifted through another wire gauze sieve, having 1,000 meshes to the square inch in order that the oxygen mixture shall not be ground to an impalpable powder, as this is very undesirable. It absorbs moisture rapidly and interferes with the regularity of the combustion when very fine. 330 grains of the powder are weighed out, after drying, and intimately incorporated with 30 grains of coal, better with a spatula than by rubbing in a mortar, and then introduced into a copper cylinder, three and a half inches long by three quarters of an inch wide, made from a copper tube, and pressed down in small portions by a test tube with such firmness as is required by the nature of the coal, not tapped on the bottom, since the rougher portions of the oxygen mixture rise to the surface. As the temperature of a room is almost invariably much higher than the water supply, a little hot water is added to that placed in the glass cylinder, until the difference of temperature between the water and the room is about the mark indicated in the following table. Room at, the water should be. 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 72, 64. 67, 60. 60, 54. 55, 50. 50, 46. 42, 40. Say, for example, the room was at 57 degrees and the water placed in the cylinder was at 46 degrees. Add a little hot water and stir with the thermometer until it assumes 52 degrees. By the time the excess of water has been removed with a pipette until it is exactly level with the mark and all is ready, the temperature will rise nearly 0.5 degrees. Let the thermometer be immersed in the water at least three minutes before reading. The fuse should be placed in the mixture and everything at hand before reading and removing the thermometer. After igniting the fuse and immersing the copper cylinder in the water, the apparatus should be kept in the best position for the gases to be evolved all around the cylinder, and the rate of combustion noted. Some coals are very unmanageable without practice, and samples of patent fuel are sometimes met with, containing unreasonable proportions of pitch, which require some caution in working and very close packing, inasmuch as small explosions occur during which a little of the fuel escapes combustion. In order that the experiment shall succeed well, experience has shown that the nature of the fuse employed has much to do with it. Plated or woven wick is not adapted and will fail absolutely with dry coals unless it is made very free burning. In this case, not less than three quarters of an inch in length is necessary, and the weight of such is very appreciable. I always use Oxford cotton and thoroughly soak it in a moderately strong solution of nitrate of potash. When dry, it should burn a little too fast. The cotton is rubbed between two pieces of cloth until it burns just freely enough. Then four cotton strands are taken, twisted together, and cut into lengths of three quarters of an inch and thoroughly dried. Open out the fuse at the lower end when placing it in the mixture so as to expose as much surface as possible in order to get a quick start, but carefully avoid pressing the material, and use a wire to fill up to the close. A slow start often spoils the experiment, through the upper end of the cylinder becoming nearly filled up with potassic chloride, etc. By paying attention to such details and following the method recommended, the apparatus yields very satisfactory results with bituminous and semi-bituminous coals. Chemical News End of Section 3section 4 of scientific american supplement number 288 july 9 1881 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine. Scientific American Supplement Number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Explosion as an Unknown Fire Hazard Words pass along with meanings which are simple conventionalities, marking current opinions, knowledge, fancies, and misjudgments. They attain to new accretions of import as knowledge advances or opinions change, and they are applied now to one set of ideas, now to another. Hence, there is nothing truer than the saying, definitions are never complete. The term explosion in its original introduction denoted the making of a noise. It grew to comprehend the idea of force, accompanied with violent outburst. It is advancing to a stage in which it implies combustion, as associated with destruction, yet somewhat distinct from the abstract idea of the resolution of any form of matter into its elementary constituents. The term, however, as yet takes in the idea of combustion as a decomposition in but a very limited degree, and it may be said to be wavering at the line between expansion and dissociation. Strictly in insurance, fire and explosion are different phenomena. A policy insuring against fire loss does not insure against loss by explosion. It thereby enforces a distinction which exists, or did exist, in the popular mind. And fire, in an insurance sense as distinct from explosion, was accurately defined by Justice McIlvain of the Supreme Court of Ohio, 1872, in the case of the Union Insurance Company v. Forte, i.e. an explosion was a remote cause of loss and not the proximate cause, when the fire was a burning of a gas jet which did not destroy, though the explosion caused by the burning gas jet did destroy. Earlier than this decision, however, in 1852, Justice Cushing of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts in Scripture v. Lowell Mutual Fire Insurance Company somewhat anticipated later definition and pronounced for the liability of the underwriter where all damage by the explosion involves the ignition and burning of the agent of explosion. That is, for example, the insurer is liable for damage caused by an explosion from gunpowder, but not for an explosion from steam. The Massachusetts judge did not conceive any distinction as to fire loss between the instantaneous burning of a barrel of gunpowder and the slower burning of a barrel of sulfur. An insurance fire loss is not to be interpreted legally by thermodynamics nor thermochemistry. While the legal principles are as yet unsettled, the tenor of current decisions may be summed up as follows. If explosion cause fire, and fire cause loss, it is a loss by fire as proximate cause. And if fire cause explosion, and explosion cause loss, it is a loss by fire as efficient cause. Smoke, an imperfect combustion, damages in an insurance sense as well as flame, which is perfect combustion and where there is concurrence of expanding air with expanding combustion, the law settles on the basis of a common account. It's all heat as a mode of motion. Explosions are the resultants of elemental gases, vaporization, communition, contact of different substances, as well as of the specifically named explosives. With new processes in manufacture involving chemical and mechanical transformations and other uses of new substances and new uses of old substances, explosions increase. The flour dust of the miller, the starch dust of the confectioner, increase in fineness and quantity, and they explode. So does the hop dust of the brewer. In 1844, for the first time, Professors Faraday and Lyle, employed by the British government, discovered that explosion in bituminous coal mines was the quickening of the comparatively slow burning of the fire damp by the almost instantaneous combustion of the fine coal dust present in the mines. The flyings of the cotton mill do not explode, but flame passes through them with a rapidity almost instantaneous, yet not sufficient to exert the pressure which explodes. The dust of the wood planer and saw only as yet make sudden puffs without detonating force. 
naphtha vapor and benzene vapor are getting into all places. One of the latest introductions is naphtha extracting oil from linseed and then volatilized by steam superheated to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. This combination reminds us, as to effectiveness, of the combination at the recent Kansas City fire, when cans of gunpowder and barrels of coal oil both went up together. But it is the unsuspected causes of explosion which make the great trouble, and prominent among these is conflagration, as itself the cause of explosion, and such explosion may develop gases which are non-supporters of combustion as well as those which are inflammable. You throw table salt down a blazing chimney to set free the flame-suppressing hydrochloric acid. You discharge a loaded gun up a blazing chimney to put out the fire by another agency. Still, the salt, with certain combinations, may be explosive. A resinous vapor may be combustive in a hydrochloric atmosphere, and gunpowder isn't harmless when thrown upon a blaze. In fact, our common fire extinguisher, water, has its explosive tendencies as liquid as well as vapor. Gases explosive in association may be set free by the temperature of a burning building and get together. In respect to the old conundrum, will saltpeter explode? Mr. A. A. Hayes, Professor Silliman, and Dr. Hare's views were, as to the explosions in the New York fire of 1845, that in a closed building having nitre in one part and shellac or other resinous material in another, the gaseous oxygen generated from the nitre and carbureted hydrogen from the resins mingling by degrees would at length constitute an explosive mixture. A brief consideration of specific explosives uniting may serve to illustrate this phase of the subject. Though the explosion of gunpowder is the result of a chemical change whereby carbonic acid gas at high tension is evolved, due to the saltpeter and the charcoal, the effect and rapidity of action are greatly promoted by the addition of sulfur. On the contrary, dynamite, now so important, and various similar explosives are but mixtures of nitroglycerin with earthy substances, in order to diminish and make more manageable the development of the rending force of the base. The explosive power of any substance is the pressure it exerts on all parts of the space containing it at the instant of explosion, and is measured by comparing the heat disengaged with the volume of gas emitted, and with the rapidity of chemical action. In the case of gunpowder, the proper manipulation and division of the grains is important, because favoring rapid deflagration, but in a purely chemical explosion, each separate molecule is an explosive, and the reaction passes from the interior of one to the interior of another, suddenly driving the atoms much further apart than their naturally infinitesimal vibrations. Purely chemical explosives like nitroglycerin, gun cotton, the pyrites, and the fulminates present a terrible danger from the unknown mode of the new union of atoms, and reaction of the particles within themselves in spontaneous explosions happening in an irregular manner. Some curious circumstances attend the manufacture and use of gun cotton, nitroglycerin, and dynamite. Baron von Link, in his system of the artillery use of gun cotton, diminishes the danger of sudden explosion by twisting the prepared cotton into cords or weaving it into cloth, thereby securing a more uniform density. Mr. Abel's mode of making gun cotton, which explosive is now used more than any other by the British government, includes drying the damp prepared cotton upon hot plates, freely open to the air. If ignited by a flame, however, in an unconfined space, gun cotton only burns with a strong blaze, but if confined where the temperature reaches 340 degrees Fahrenheit, it explodes with terrific violence. Somewhat similar is the action of nitroglycerin and dynamite, which simply burn if ignited in the open air, while the same substance will explode through a very slight concussion or by the application of the electric spark. A red-hot iron, also, if applied, will explode them when a flame will not. With care, nitroglycerin can be kept many years without deterioration and it has been heated in a sand bath to 80 degrees Celsius for a whole day without explosion or alteration. One curious experiment is deserving of mention. 
If a broad-headed nail be partly driven into pine wood, and then some pieces of dynamite placed on the head of the nail, the latter may be struck hard blows with a wooden mallet without exploding the dynamite, so long as the nail will continue to enter the wood. Taking gunpowder as the unit, picrate of potash, picric acid, and potassium has five times more force, gun cotton seven and a half times, and nitroglycerin ten times more force. There are others still more powerful, but less known and used, and some explosives are quite uncontrollable and useless. But the particular object of these remarks is to refer to articles of merchandise non-explosive under general conditions, but so in particular circumstances, as the two fire extinguishers, water and salt, are explosive under given conditions. The memorable fire, which in July 1850 destroyed 300 buildings in Philadelphia upon Delaware Avenue, Water, Front, and Vine Streets, was largely extended by explosions of possibly concealed or unknown materials. The presence of the generally recognized explosives being denied by the owners of the properties. The germ of the first knowledge of an explosive was probably the accidental discovery, ages ago, of the deflagrating property of the natural saltpeter when in contact with incandescent charcoal. Although much manipulation is deemed necessary to form the close mechanical mixture of the materials of gunpowder, it has never been proved that such intimate previous union is necessary to precede the chemical reaction causing explosion. Indeed, some explosions in powder works before the mixture of the materials, or just at its commencement, seem to point to the contrary. It is also certain that in the manufacture of gunpowder, the usual nitrate of potassium, saltpeter, can be replaced by the nitrates of soda, barda, and ammonia, also by the chloride of potassium, charcoal by sawdust, tan, resin, and starch, and though a substitute for sulfur is not easily found, the latter, or a similar substance, is not an absolute necessity in the composition of gunpowder. The generally received theory of the chemical action which makes gunpowder explosive is that it is due to the superior affinity of the oxygen of the niter, KNO3, for the carbon of the charcoal, and the production of carbonic acid gas, CO2, and carbonic oxide, CO, suddenly and in great volume. The latter extinguishes the flame as well as the former, unless its own flammability is supported by the oxygen of the atmosphere until the degree of the oxygenation CO2 is reached. Considering that water, H2O, is composed of two volumes of hydrogen and one of oxygen, and that under an enormously high temperature and the excessive affinity of oxygen gas for potassium or sodium, freed from nitrate union, dissociation of the water may be possible, aided by its being in the form of spray and steam. We would hesitate to deny that an explosive union of suitable crude salts could occur during the burning of a building containing them, when water for extinguishment was put on. Anyone who has seen the brilliance with which potassium and sodium burn upon water can easily imagine how such strong affinity of oxygen for these substances might aid in severing its union in water in their presence and under extraordinary heat. It might be safe to say that the presence of water under very high temperature may be as aidful to form an explosive among such salts as have been named as sulfur is for the rapid combustion of gunpowder. In the review for August 1862, Saltpeter Deflagrations in Burning Buildings and Vessels, Water as an Explosive Agency, it was shown that Mr. Boyden's experiments in 1861-62 to proved that explosions would occur when water was put on nitre heated alone, and stronger explosion from nitre, dry wood, and sulfur also explosion when melted nitre was poured on water. The following points we reproduce for comparison. If common salt be heated separately to a bright heat and water at 150 degrees Fahrenheit poured on it, an explosion will occur. Nitre mixed with common salt, placed upon burning charcoal and water added, produce a stronger explosion than salt alone. 
Heating caustic potash to a white heat and adding warm or hot water produces explosion. At a Boston fire, small explosions were observed upon water touching culinary salt highly heated. Anthracite coal and niter heated in a crucible exploded when seawater was poured on them. The production of explosion by the putting of water on nitrate of potassium and chloride of sodium arises from the union, at high temperature, of the oxygen of the water with the potash and soda. Of the three liberated gases, hydrogen only is inflammable, and the other two suffocative of flame. But together, the nitrogen and chlorine are not to be undervalued, for chloride of nitrogen is ranked as the most terrible and unmanageable of all explosives. Chlorine is a great water separator, but in the present case, its affinity for hydrogen would result in hydrochloric acid, a fire extinguisher. What happens in chemical experiment may be developed on a large scale in burning grocery, drug, or dry salter stores when great quantities of materials, such as just mentioned, including common salt, almost always present, are heated most intensely and then subjected to the action of water in heavy dashes, or in form of spray or steam. Picric acid, the nature of which we have several times previously mentioned, and which explodes at 600 degrees Fahrenheit, only 28 degrees above gunpowder, may also be an element in such explosions during fires. Its salts form, in combinations, various powerful explosives, much exceeding gunpowder in force, and they have been used to a considerable extent in Europe. Picric acid, now much employed by manufacturers and dyers for obtaining a yellow color, is always kept in store largely by dry salters and druggists, and generally by dyers, but in smaller quantity. In a very destructive fire which occurred in Liverpool, England in October 1874, involving the loss of several fireproof stores, repeated explosions of the vapor of turpentine rent ponderous brick-arched vaults, and exposed to the flames stalks of cotton, etc., in the stories above. This conflagration was started by the carelessness of an employee in snuffing a tallow candle with his fingers and throwing the burning snuff onto the open bunghole of a sample barrel of turpentine, of which liquid there were many hundreds of barrels on storage in the buildings. Turpentine vapor united with chlorine gas may not produce explosion, but by spreading flames almost instantaneously throughout the burning buildings, such burnings have practically equaled, if not excelled, explosions, which may sometimes be fire extinguishers. In such cases, detonation may be prevented by there being ample space to receive the suddenly ignited vapor, lessening the tension of it, but carrying the flames much more rapidly than otherwise to inflammable materials at great distance. If disastrous results have arisen from the vapor of turpentine as a fire spreader in vaults without windows, it is possible that if a quantity of hot water were suddenly converted into steam in closely confined spaces, effects of pressure might be observed, less destructive perhaps, but resembling those which other explosives might produce. If the immense temperature attained in some conflagrations be considered sufficient to melt iron and vitrify brick, it is possible to conceive of water as being instantly converted into steam. Even a very small quantity of water thus expanded could produce most disastrous results. While such formation of steam, if it happened, would certainly extinguish most flames in direct contact, the general phenomena shown would be explosive. A curious circumstance occurred at the Broad Street, New York, fire in 1845, previously mentioned. The fire extended through to Broadway and almost to Bowling Green. A shock like a dull explosion was heard, and by many this was attributed to the effects of gunpowder and saltpeter. Several firemen were, at the moment of the shock, on the roof of the burning building, when the whole roof was suddenly raised and then let down into the street, carrying the men with it uninjured. One of the firemen described the sensation as if the roof had been first hoisted up and then squashed down. Quarry, was this like the common lifting and falling back of the loose lid of a tea kettle containing boiling water? Was it from steam, at a low pressure perhaps, seeking vent through the roof in like manner to the raising of the kettle lid? 
Without dilating on this part of the subject, we mention it as a possible cause of minor explosions, doubtless to become better known in the future. It may even be that explosions happening from steam, acting in close spaces, may have been attributed to gunpowder, or to nitre and other salts, separate, but suddenly caused to combine in chemical reaction. American Exchange and Review End of Section 4《ジョライ・ナイン・エイティン・エディワン・ディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エディス・エ By T. A. Pooley. This element, which next deserves our attention, is one of great importance and wide distribution. It occurs in nature in both the free and the combined states, and the number of compounds which it forms with other elements is very large. Unlike the previous elementary bodies we have studied, carbon is only known to us in the solid form when free, although many of its combinations are gaseous at the ordinary temperature and pressure. Carbon is known to exist in several different physical states. Thus, illustrating what chemists call allotropism, which means that substances of identical chemical composition sometimes possess altogether different outward and physical appearances. Thus, the three states in which pure carbon exists, namely diamond, graphite, or plumbago, and charcoal, are as different as possible, and yet chemically they are all exactly the same substance. The diamond is the purest carbon and occurs in the crystalline form known as a regular octahedron. The diamond is one of the hardest substances known and is therefore utilized for cutting glass. It has also a very high specific gravity, namely 3.5, which means that it is three and a half times heavier than water, and it is far heavier than any of the other allotropic modifications of carbon. Graphite or plumbago, the second form in which carbon occurs, is widely distributed in nature, and the finer qualities are known as black lead. Although no lead enters into their composition, as they are composed of carbon almost as pure as the diamond. The specific gravity of graphite is only 2.3. Charcoal, the third allotropic modification of carbon, is by far the most common and is formed by the natural or artificial disintegration of organic matters by heat. We thus have formed wood charcoal, animal charcoal, lamp black, and coke, all produced by artificial means. And we may also class with these coal, which is a natural product and which contains from 85 to 95% of pure carbon. Wood charcoal is made by heating wood in closed vessels or in large masses when all the hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen are expelled in the gaseous state, and the carbon is left mixed with the mineral constituents of the wood. This form of carbon is very porous and light and is used in a number of industrial processes. Animal charcoal, as its name implies, is the carbonaceous residue left on heating any animal matters in a retort, and contains, in addition to the carbon, a large proportion of phosphates and other mineral salts, which, however, can be extracted by dilute acids. Animal charcoal possesses to a remarkable degree the property of removing color from solutions of animal and vegetable substances, and it is used for this purpose to a large extent by sugar refiners, who thus decolorize their dark brown syrups. In the manufacture of glucose and saccharones for brewers' use, the concentrated solutions have to be filtered through layers of animal charcoal in order that the resulting product may be freed from color. The decolorizing power of animal charcoal can be easily tested by any brewer by causing a little dark colored wort to filter through a layer of this material. After passing through once or twice, the color will entirely disappear or, at all events, be greatly reduced in intensity. Animal charcoal also absorbs gases with great avidity, and on this account it is utilized as a powerful disinfectant. For when once putrefactive gases are absorbed by it, they undergo a gradual oxidation and are rendered innocuous. In the same way, animal charcoal is a valuable agent for purifying water, for by filtering the most impure water through a bed of animal charcoal, nearly the whole of the organic impurities will be completely removed. Lamp black is the name given to those varieties of carbon 
which are deposited when hydrocarbons are burned with an insufficient supply of oxygen. Thus the smoke and soot emitted into our atmosphere from our furnaces and fireplaces are composed of comparatively pure carbon. Coal is an impure form of carbon derived from the gradual oxidation and destruction of vegetable matters by natural causes. Thus wood first changes into a peaty substance and subsequently into a body called lignite, which again in its turn becomes converted into the different varieties of coal. These changes, which have resulted in the accumulation of vast beds of coal in the crust of the earth, have been going on for ages. There are very many different kinds of coal, some are rich in hydrogen and are therefore well adapted for making illuminating gas, while others, such as anthracite, are very rich in carbon and contain but little hydrogen. The last named variety of coal is smokeless and is therefore largely used for drying malt. Carbon occurs in nature also in a combined state. Limestone, chalk, and marble contain 12% of this element. It is also present in the atmosphere in the form of carbonic acid, and the same compound of carbon is present in well and river waters, both in the free state and combined with lime and magnesia. All animal and vegetable organisms contain a large proportion of carbon as an essential constituent. Albumin contains about 53%, alcohol contains 52%, starch 44%, cane sugar 42%, and so on. The presence of carbon in the large class of bodies known to chemists as carbohydrates, of which starch and sugar are prominent examples, can be easily demonstrated. If a little strong sulfuric acid be added to some powdered cane sugar in a glass, the mass will soon begin to darken in color and swell up, and in the course of a few minutes, a mass of black porous carbon will separate, which can be purified from the acid by repeated washings. The sugar is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, the last two named elements being present in the exact proportion necessary to form water. The sulfuric acid having a strong affinity for water removes the hydrogen and oxygen, and the carbon is then left in a free state. Carbon forms two compounds with oxygen, carbon monoxide, commonly called carbonic oxide, and carbon dioxide, commonly called carbonic acid and the last named, being of the most importance, will be studied first. Carbon dioxide or carbonic acid, symbol CO2. Carbonic acid occurs, as we have already stated, in large quantities in combination with lime and magnesia, forming immense rock formations of limestone, chalk, marble, dolomite, etc. It also issues in a gaseous state from volcanoes, and it is always present in small quantities in the atmosphere. It is found dissolved in well and river waters and is a product of the respiration of animals. Brewers are also well aware of the existence of this body, for it is evolved in enormous quantities during the alcoholic fermentation of saccharine liquids. When carbonaceous substances are burnt, the bulk of the carbon is converted into carbonic acid, and thus our furnaces and fireplaces are continually emitting enormous quantities of carbonic acid into the atmosphere. With these different sources of supply, it might reasonably be thought that carbonic acid would be gradually accumulating in our atmosphere. The breathing of animals, the eruption of volcanoes, the combustion of fuel, and the fermentation of sugar are ever going on, and to a fast increasing extent with the progress of civilization. And yet, the proportion of carbonic acid in our atmosphere is no greater now than it was at the earliest time when exact chemical research determined its presence and quantity. A counteracting influence is always at work. Nature has beautifully provided for this by causing plants to absorb carbonic acid, holding some of the carbon and allowing the oxygen to escape again into the atmosphere to restore the equilibrium of purity. This mutual evolution and absorption of carbonic acid is continually going on. Occasionally there may be either an excess or a deficiency in a particular place, but fortunately any irregularity in this respect is soon overcome and the air retains its original composition. Otherwise, animal life on the face of the globe would be doomed to gradual but sure extinction. Carbonic acid can be prepared for experimental purposes by causing dilute hydrochloric acid to act upon fragments of marble placed in a bottle with two necks, into one neck of which a funnel passing through a cork is fixed, and into the other a bent tube for conveying the gas into any suitable receiver. The evolution of carbonic acid by this method is rapid, but easily regulated, and the gas may be purified by causing it to pass through some water contained in another two-necked bottle. 
similar to the generator. The chemical change involved in this decomposition is expressed by the following equation. CaCO3 calcium carbonate plus 2HCl hydrochloric acid equals CO2 carbonic acid plus H2O water plus CaCl2 calcium chloride. By referring to the table of combining weights given in a previous paper, it will be seen that 100 parts of calcium carbonate will yield 44 parts of carbonic acid. Instead of hydrochloric acid, any other acid may be used. And in the practical manufacture of carbonic acid for aerated waters, sulfuric acid is the one usually employed. Carbonic acid is colorless and inodorous, but has a peculiar sharp taste. It is half as heavy again as air, its exact specific gravity being 1,529. 100 cubic inches weigh 47.26 grains. It is uninflammable and does not support combustion or animal respiration. Under a pressure of about 38 atmospheres, at a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, carbonic acid condenses into a colorless liquid, which may also be frozen into a compact mass resembling ice or into a white powder like snow. Carbonic acid is soluble in water, and at the ordinary pressure and temperature, one volume of water will hold in solution one volume of the gas. Under increased pressures, far greater quantities of the gas can be held in solution, but this is rapidly evolved as soon as the excess of pressure is removed. Upon this property, the manufacture of aerated waters depends. The presence of free carbonic acid can be easily detected by causing the gas to pass over the surface of some clear lime water. If any be present, a white film of carbonate of lime will at once be formed. In testing carbonic acid in a state of combination, the gas must first be liberated by acting upon the substance with a stronger acid, and then applying the lime water test. The presence of large quantities of carbonic acid in a gaseous mixture can be readily detected by plunging into the vessel a lighted taper, which will be immediately extinguished. This ought always to be adopted in a brewery where many fatal accidents have happened through workmen going down into empty fermenting vats and wells without first taking this precaution. The presence of carbon in this colorless gas can be demonstrated by causing some of it to pass over a piece of the metal potassium placed in a hard glass tube and heated to dull redness. The potassium then eagerly combines with the oxygen, forming oxide of potassium, and the carbon is liberated and can be separated in the form of a black powder by washing the tube out with water. Carbon monoxide or carbonic oxide, symbol CO. This is formed when carbon is burnt with an insufficient supply of oxygen, or when carbonic acid gas is passed over some carbon heated to redness. This gas is continually being formed in our furnaces and fireplaces. At the lower part of the furnace where the air enters, the carbon is converted into carbonic acid, which in its turn has to pass through some red-hot coals so that before reaching the surface it is again converted into carbonic oxide. Over the surface of the fire, this carbonic oxide meets with a fresh supply of oxygen and is then again converted into carbonic acid. The peculiar blue lambent flame often observed on the surface of our open fireplaces is due to the combustion of carbonic oxide, which has been formed in the way we have just described. Carbonic oxide is a colorless, tasteless gas, which differs from carbonic acid by being combustible and by not having any action on lime water. Brewer's Guardian. End of section 5. Section 6 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Seifert's Pyrometer. The thermometers and pyrometers usually employed are almost all based on the expansion of some fluid or other, or upon that of different metals. The first can only be constructed with glass tubes, thus rendering them fragile. The second are often wanting in exactness, because of the change that the molecules of a solid body undergo through heat, 
thus preventing them from returning to exactly their first position on cooling. The principle of the Seifert pyrometer is based on the fact that the pressure of saturated vapors, that is, vapors which remain in communication with the liquid which has produced them, preserves a constant ratio with the temperature of such liquid, while, on the other hand, the temperature of the latter, when shut up in a vessel, will correspond exactly with that of the medium into which it is introduced. This instrument is composed of a metallic vessel or tube which contains the liquid to be exposed to heat and of a spring manometric apparatus communicating with the tube and by means of which the existing temperature is shown. The dial may be provided with index needles to show minimum and maximum temperatures as well as be connected with electric bells. Figure 1. Giving one or more signals at maximum and minimum temperatures. The vessel to contain the liquid may be of any form whatever, but it is usually made in the shape of a straight or a bent tube. The nature of the metal of which the latter is made is subordinate, not only to the maximum temperature to which the apparatus are to be exposed, but also to the nature of the liquid employed. It is of either yellow metal or iron. To prevent oxidation of the tube when iron is employed, it is enclosed within another iron tube and the space between the two is filled in with lead. When the apparatus is exposed to a high temperature, the lead melts and prevents the air from reaching the inner tube so that no oxidation can take place. Pyrometers filled with ether. These are tubular and constructed of yellow metal and are graduated from 35 degrees C to 120 degrees. They are used for obtaining temperatures in vacuum apparatus, cooking apparatus, diffusion apparatus, saturators, etc. Figures 2, 3, 4, and 5 show the different modes of mounting the apparatus according to the purpose for which it is designed. Pyrometers filled with distilled water are used for ascertaining temperatures ranging from 100 degrees to 265 degrees C, 80 degrees to 210 degrees R, or 212 degrees to 510 degrees F. Pyrometers filled with mercury are constructed for ascertaining temperatures from 360 degrees to 750 degrees C. Application of the pyrometer in bone black furnaces. The temperature necessary for the complete carbonization of the organic substances of animal charcoal is from 430 degrees to 500 degrees C. In order to transmit this temperature from the cylinder to the charcoal, it is indispensable that the air surrounding the cylinder be heated to 480 degrees to 550 degrees. If the heating of the animal black exceeds 500 degrees, the product hardens diminishes in volume, and loses its porosity. There are two methods of ascertaining the temperature of the red-hot bone black by means of the pyrometer. First, by inserting the tube of the instrument into the black, figure 6a. Second, by finding the temperature of the hot gases in the furnaces, figure 6b. In the first case, the plunge tube should be of sufficient length to allow its extremity to penetrate to the very bottom layer of the red-hot black. This mode of direct control of the temperature of the black is only employed for ascertaining the work accomplished by the furnace, that is to say, the ratio existing between the temperature of the hot air surrounding the cylinder and the black itself. This calculation being effected, it is useless to note the differences of temperature which arise in the spaces between the cylinders of which the furnace is composed. The position that the pyrometer should occupy is subordinate to the construction of the furnace. Figure 6 shows the type which is most employed. In a furnace with lateral fireplace, CC are the heating cylinders and DD the cooling cylinders. CD is the plate on which are mounted vertically the former and from which are suspended the latter. B shows the pyrometer, 
the length of which must be such that the manometric apparatus shall stand out one or two inches from the external surface of the wall, while its tube, traversing the wall, shall reach the very last row of heating cylinders. That the apparatus may form a permanent regulator for the stoker, it is well to adapt to it an arrangement permitting of a graphic control of the work accomplished and signaling by means of an electric bell when the temperature of the gases in the furnace descends below 480 degrees C or rises above 550 degrees C. Application of the apparatus to brick furnaces and in the manufacture of chemical products. The operation of heating brick furnaces is generally performed according to empirical methods, the temperature having to vary much according to the products that it is desired to obtain. It is necessary, however, for a like product to maintain as uniform a temperature as possible. These observations are particularly applicable to continuous furnaces such as annular brick furnaces, etc., in which a uniformity of temperature in the different chambers is of vital importance to perfect the baking. In these furnaces, the tube of the pyrometer is inserted through one of the apertures at the top, as shown in figure 7. The dial is graduated up to 750 degrees, which is more than sufficient, since the temperature of the upper part of a compartment fully exposed to the heat rarely exceeds 670 degrees to 680 degrees C. End of section 6. Read by John D. Parker. Section 7 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881 by various manufacturer soaps and their production by w j menzies potash soaps are generally superior to soda soaps for most purposes but more especially in washing wool and woolen goods the difference between the use of a potash and a soda soap for these purposes is very marked potash lubricates the fiber of the wool renders it soft and silky and to a certain extent, bleaches it. Soda, on the other hand, has a tendency to turn wool a yellow color and renders the fiber hard and brittle. It cannot be too strongly insisted upon, therefore, that nothing but a potash soap, or some form of potash in preference to soda if an alkali alone is employed, should be used in washing wool in any form, either manufactured or unmanufactured. This is fully borne out by nature, who invariably assimilates the most appropriate substances. Wool, when growing in its natural state, is lubricated and protected by a sticky substance called grease, or suente. This consists to the extent of nearly half its weight of carbonate of potash, hardly a trace of soda being present. It is very evident, therefore, that potash must be more suitable for washing wool than soda as the teaching of nature is always correct. There are certain prejudices against the use of potash soap, which have, to a great extent, prevented its more extensive use. Many consumers of soap fancy that because a potash soap is soft, it necessarily must contain more water than a soda soap. This, however, is quite an erroneous notion. A potash soap is soft, because it is the nature of all potash soaps to be so, just the same way that on the other hand all soda soaps are hard. As an actual fact, a good potash soap contains less water than many quite hard soda soaps that are now in the market. Another reason is that soap makers have had every interest in using soda in preference to potash, particularly when latterly soda has been so cheap. Potash not only is a more expensive alkali, 
but its combining equivalent is greatly against it as compared with soda. That is to say that 31 parts of actual or anhydrous soda will saponify as much tallow or oil as 47 parts of anhydrous potash. It will be evident, therefore, that the use of potash instead of soda is decidedly more advantageous to the soap boiler, and more particularly in the present age, when the demand is for cheap articles, often quite without regard to the quality or purpose for which they are to be used. As far as consumers are concerned, this has been a mistake. Potash soap, though it may cost more, is in the most cases actually the most economical. Soap is never used in exact chemical equivalents, but an excess is always taken. Potash soap is much more soluble than a soda soap. It therefore penetrates the fiber and consequently removes dirt and grease much more quickly. Notwithstanding, also, that its chemical combining equivalent is greater than that of soda. It is, nevertheless, the strongest base and always combines with any substance in preference to soda. For these reasons, probably combined also with the fact that in the whole realm of the animal and vegetable kingdoms to which all textile fabrics belong, potash is more naturally assimilated than soda. A smaller quantity of potash soap will do more practical work than a larger quantity of soda soap. There are other reasons why potash soaps have not been used. Originally, soft soap was made either with fish oil or olive oil. Fish oil is objectionable as the strong smell imparted to the soap renders it unfit for many finishing purposes. Nothing can be better than olive oil soap, but it is a costly article and only can be used for finer purposes. There are now, however, many of the seed oils that are much cheaper. Linseed, rapeseed, and cottonseed all produce a good soap. Cottonseed oil is particularly suitable for the purpose. The manufacture of this oil during the last few years has been brought to great perfection, and the cost is now much less than that of tallow or any other seed oil. It is now difficult to distinguish a well-refined cottonseed oil from olive oil. It is therefore in every way suitable for making soft soap. One of the chief causes, however, why potash soap has not been more generally made is that a convenient form of potash has been unobtainable. For many years, the only source of potash was from the ashes of burnt trees. These ashes are collected, mixed with lime, lixiviated, and the resulting lye boiled down. The result is a very impure form of potash, also of a very variable composition, depending upon the trees used for the purpose. Canada has been the principal source of supply of this form of potash, hence the commercial name of Montreal potashes. The classification of firsts, seconds, and thirds is from the inspection at the warehouse there. This, however, is exceedingly superficial the ashes being simply tested for their alkaline strength, with no discrimination between potash and soda, which is a difficult and delicate chemical test. Soda being now far cheaper than potash, and also the alkaline equivalent, as previously explained, being greatly in favor of soda, there has been every inducement to enterprising producers of ashes to adulterate them with soda, which in many cases, has been largely done. Another source of potash has been beetroot ashes, very similar to wood ashes, and also German carbonate of potash, which latter about corresponds to a common soda ash, as compared with caustic soda. With these articles, a tedious boiling process, very similar to the old process for the production of hard soap, had to be adopted. The ashes or carbonate of potash, previously being dissolved and causticized with lime by the soap maker. The production of a first-class soft soap was also a very difficult operation, as the impurities and soda contained varied considerably. 
often causing the boil to go wrong and give considerable trouble to the soap boiler. During the last two years, however, caustic potash has been introduced that manufactured by the Green Bank Alkali Company of St. Helens being very nearly pure. With this article, there is no difficulty in producing a pure potash soap, either for wool scouring, fulling, or sizing by a cold process very similar to that described for the production of hard soda soap with pure powdered caustic soda. The following directions will produce an excellent soap for wool scouring. 50 pounds of Green Bank pure caustic potash are put into 8 gallons of soft water. The potash dissolves immediately, heating the water. This lye is allowed to cool and then slowly added with continual mixing to 20 gallons of cottonseed oil mixed with 20 pounds of melted tallow, the whole being brought to a temperature of about 90 degrees F. After stirring for some minutes, so as to completely combine the lye and oil, the mixture is left for two days in a warm place, when a slow and gradual saponification of the mass takes place. If, when examined, the oil and lye are then found not completely combined, the stiff soap is again stirred and left two days, when the saponification will be found complete, the result being the formation of about 330 pounds of very stiff potash soap, each pound being equal to about two pounds of the ordinary fig soap sold. The requisite quantity is thrown into the scouring vat with about 5% of its weight of refined pearl ash to increase the alkali present, the weight depending somewhat upon the kind of wool washed on purpose for which the soap is required. If the wool is very dirty or greasy, Rather, a stronger soap is sometimes advisable. This can easily be attained by reducing the quantity of oil used to 18 gallons. The advantages to be gained by the wool scourer or other consumer making his own potash soap are that a pure, uniform article can always be thus produced at a less cost than that at which the soap can be bought. Potash soap, like soda soap now sold, is much adulterated in addition to all the impurities originally contained in the potash used, and which, unlike soda soap, cannot be separated by any salting process. Many other adulterations are added to increase the weight and cheapen the cost. Silicate of potash, resin, and potato flour are all more or less employed for this purpose, to the gain of the soap maker and at the expense of the consumer. The production of potash soap for fulfilling and sizing and the most suitable oils and tallow for the production of the various qualities required for these purposes must be reserved for the next issue. Textile Manufacturer End of Section 7 Read by John D. Parker Section 8 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. The Preparation of Perfume Pomades We have, on a previous occasion, described the process of maceration, or enfleurage, that is, the impregnation of purified fat with the aroma of certain scented flowers, which do not yield any essential oil in paying quantities. At present, we wish to describe an apparatus which is used in several large establishments in Europe for obtaining such products on the large scale and within as short a time as possible. The drawing gives the idea of the general arrangement of the parts rather than the actual appearance of a working apparatus, for the latter will have to vary according to the conveniences and interior arrangements of the factory. A series of frames with wire sieve bottoms are charged with a layer of fat in form of fine curly threads, 
obtained by pressing or rubbing the fat through a finely perforated sieve the frames are then placed one on top of the other and to make the connection between them airtight press together in a screw press a reservoir e is charged with a suitable quantity of the flowers etc and tightly closed with the cover after which the bellows are set into motion by any power most convenient scented air is thereby drawn from the reservoir e through the pipe g b toward the stack of frames containing the finely divided fat which latter absorbs the aroma while the nearly deodorized air is sent back to the reservoir by the pipe d to be freshly charged and again sent on its circuit this apparatus is said to facilitate the turning out of nearly twenty times the amount of pomade for the same number of frames and the same time as the old process of enfleurage it might be called the ensouffleage process new remedies end of section eight section nine of scientific american supplement number two hundred eighty eight july ninth eighteen eighty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b scientific american supplement number two hundred eighty eight july ninth eighteen eighty one by various organic matter in sea water at a recent meeting of the london chemical society mr w jago read a paper on the organic matter in sea water on page one hundred thirty three of the sixth report of the rivers commission it is stated that the proportion of organic elements in sea water varies between such wide limits in different samples as to suggest that much of the organic matter consists of living organisms so minute and gelatinous as to pass readily through the best filters at the suggestion of dr franklin the author has investigated this subject the water was collected in mid-channel between new haven and dieppe by the engineers of the london brighton and south coast railway in stoppered glass carboys the author has used the combustion method the albuminoid ammonia and in some cases the oxygen process of professor tidy to determine how the various methods of water analysis were affected by a change of the organic matter from organic compounds in solution to organisms in suspension some experiments were made with hay infusion the results confirmed those of kingzet chemical society journal eighteen eighty fifteen the oxygen required first rising and then diminishing the author concludes that the organic matter of sea water is much more capable of resisting oxidizing agents than that present in ordinary fresh waters and that the organic matter in sea water is probably organized and alive bacteria life w m hamlet in a paper before the london chemical society said flasks similar to those of pasteur etudes sur la bière page eighty one holding about one quarter liter were used the liquids employed were pasteur's fluid with sugar beef tea hay infusion urine brewer's wort and extract of meat each flask was about half filled and boiled for ten minutes whereby all previously existing life was destroyed the flask was then allowed to cool the entering air being filtered through a plug of glass wool or asbestos the flask was then inoculated with a small quantity of previously cultivated hay solution or pasteur's fluid hydrogen oxygen carbonic oxide marsh gas nitrogen and sulfuretted hydrogen were without effect on the bacteria chlorine and hydric peroxide about seven per cent of a five volume solution were fatal to bacteria the action of various salts and organic acids in five per cent solution was tried many including potash soda potassic bisulfite sodic hyposulfite potassic chlorate potassic permanganate oxalic acid 
acetic acid glycerin laudanum and alcohol were without effect on the bacterial life others the alums ferrous sulfate ferric chloride magnesic and aluminic chlorides bleaching powder camphor salicylic acid chloroform creosote and carbolic acid decidedly arrested the development of bacteria the author has made a more extended examination of the action of chloroform especially as regards the statement of munz that bacteria cannot exist in the presence of two and one half percent of chloroform which substance is therefore useful in distinguishing physiological from chemical ferments the author concludes that amounts of chloroform phenol and creosote varying from one-fourth to three per cent do not destroy bacteria although their functional activity is decidedly arrested while in contact with these reagents to use the author's words bacteria may be pickled in creosote and carbolic acid without being deprived of their vitality the author concludes that the substances which destroy bacteria are those which are capable of exerting an immediate and powerful oxidizing action and that it is active oxygen whether from the action of chlorine ozone or peroxide of hydrogen which must be regarded as the greatest known enemy to bacteria mr hamlet in replying to some remarks of messrs kingsett and williams said that in all cases the solution which he had used had been completely sterilized by exposure to a temperature of 105 degrees for 10 minutes the india rubber tubing he had used was steamed carbolic acid solution must contain at least five percent of carbolic acid to be fatal to bacteria he was quite aware of the importance of distinguishing between the action of the substances on various kinds of bacteria and was quite prepared to admit that a treatment which would be fatal to one kind of bacterium might not injure another end of section nine Section 10 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org, read by Stacy M. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various, on the composition of elephant's milk by Chaz A. Doremus, M.D., Ph.D. Noticing the recent advertisements in the city regarding the baby elephant, it occurred to me that perhaps no analysis of the milk of the species of the mammalia had been recorded. This I found corroborated, for though the milk of many animals had been subjected to an analysis, no opportunity had ever presented itself to obtain elephant's milk. Through the courtesy of Jaz A. Bailey, I was enabled to procure samples of the milk on several occasions. On March 10, 1880, the elephant Hebe gave birth to the female calf, America. Hebe is now 28 years old, and the father of the calf, Mandry, 32. Since the birth of the baby, the mother has been in excellent health, except during about 10 days, when she suffered from a slight indisposition, which soon left her. When born, the calf weighed 213 half pounds and in April 1881 weighed 900 pounds, a very fair year's growth on a milk diet. At the time I procured the samples, both mother and calf were in fine health. To obtain the milk was a matter of some difficulty. The calf was constantly sucking, nursing two or three times an hour, morning, noon, and night. The milk could be drawn from either of the two teats, but only in small quantity. The mother gave the fluid freely enough, apparently to her infant, but sparingly to inquisitive man. So the ruse had to be resorted to of milking one teat while the calf was at the other. When I first examined the specimens, they seemed watery. But to my surprise, on allowing the milk to stand, I could not help wondering at the large percentage of cream. The following represents approximately the daily diet of the mother. Three pecks of oats, one bucket bran mash, five or six loaves of bread, half a bushel of roots, potatoes, etc., 50 to 75 pounds of hay, and 40 gallons of water. 
Elephants eat continually, little at a time to be sure, but are constantly picking. This habit is also observable in the way the calf nurses. The first specimen of milk was procured on the morning of April 5, the second on the 9th, and the third on the 10th. The last exceeded the others in quantity and is therefore the fairest of the three. It took several milkings to get even these, for the calf would begin to nurse, then stop, and when she stopped, the flow of milk did also. I was assured by Mr. Cross and the keeper, Mr. Copeland, that the milk I obtained had all the appearances of that drawn at various times since the birth of the calf. Mr. Cross, when in Boston, compared the milk with that from an Alderney cow and found the volume of cream greater. I endeavored to have the calf kept away from the mother for some hours, but could not, since she has allowed her freedom, as she worries under restraint, and, besides, has never been taken from the mother. The calf picked at oats and hay, but was dependent on the mother for nourishment. It would have been a matter of great satisfaction to me had I been able to obtain a larger quantity of the milk or to have gained even an approximate knowledge of the daily yield, but was obliged to content myself with what I could get. By comparing several samples, however, a just conclusion regarding the quality was found. The analyses of the samples gave the following results. Number 1. April 5, morning. Quantity, 19 cc. Cream, 52 to 4. Volume, percent. Reaction, neutral. In 100 parts by weight. Water, 67.567 67.567 solids 32.433 fat 17.546 solids not fat 14.887 casein 14.236 sugar 14.236 ash 0.651 number 2 april 9 noon quantity 36 cc cream 58 reaction slightly alkaline in 100 parts by weight. Water, 69.286. Solids, 30.714. Fat, 19.095. Solids, not fat, 11.619. Casein, 3.694. Sugar, 7.267. Ash, 0.658. Number 3, April 10, morning. Quantity, 72 cc. Cream, 62. Reaction, slightly acid. Specific gravity, 1023.7 in 100 parts by weight. Water, 66.697. Solids, 33.303. Fat, 22.070. Solids, not fat, 11.233. Casein, 3.212. Sugar, 7.392. Ash, 0.629. 10 grams were taken for analysis. And in number three, duplicates were made. It is evident from these analyses that the milk approaches the composition of cream, yet it did not have the consistency of ordinary cream, as cream even rose upon it. Under the microscope, the globules presented a very perfect outline and were beautifully even in size and very transparent. The cream rose quickly, leaving a layer of bluish tinge below. The milk was pleasant in flavor and odor, and very superior in these respects to that of many animals such as goats or camels, and in quality equal to that of cows, nor did the milk emit any rank odor on heating. When 10 grams were evaporated to dryness, the last portions of water were hard to remove as the residue fairly floated with oil. Only by long continued application of heat and in analysis 3 over sulfuric acid in vacuo could a constant weight be obtained. I would have used sand in the drying or Baumhauer's method of fat extraction, but for the small quantity of milk at my disposal and from fear of loss of fat in the latter case. The fat in three was determined by extracting the dried residue and also with 20 cc of milk by adding alkali and shaking with ether, removing and evaporating the ether and weighing the fat. As is shown in the table, the specific gravity is very low, though the solids and solids not fat are great. The ash, casein, and sugar are in about the usual proportion. The weight of casein, it is true, is but half that of the sugar. The milk indeed shows an unusually great preponderance of the non-nitrogenized elements, 
and this seems to correspond with the wants of the animal, since fatty tissues are greatly developed in elephants. According to Mr. Cross, who has had large experience with these animals, they are fatter in the wild state than in bondage. These specimens must appear as exceptional. They may be considered by some as strippings. But as against such a view, we have the recurrence in each sample of the same characteristics in the milk and a near correspondence in the composition. As may be seen from the subjoined analyses given by V. Gorup Pisanes, 1. The milk belongs to the class of which woman's and mare's milk are members, especially as regards the proportion of the non-nitrogenized to the nitrogenized elements. Constituents. Woman, cow, goat, ewe, ass, mare, buffalo, camel, sow, hippopotamus, elephant. Water. Woman. 86.271. Cow. 84.28. Goat. 86.85. U, 83.30. Ass, 89.01. Mare, 90.45. Buffalo, 80.640. Camel, 86.34. Sow, 81.80. Hippopotamus, 90.43. Elephant, 66.697. Solids, woman, 13.729. Cow, 15.72. Goat, 13.52. U, 16.60. Ass, 10.99. Mare, 9.55. Buffalo, 19.360. Camel, 13.66. Sow, 18.20. Hippopotamus, 9.57. Elephant, 33.308. Fat, woman, 5.370. Cow, 5.47. Goat, 4.34. U, 6.05. Ass, 1.85. Mare, 1.31. Buffalo, 8.450. Camel, 2.90. Sow, 6.00. Hippopotamus, 4.51. Elephant, 22.070. Casein, woman, 2.950. Cow, 3.57. Goat, 2.53. U, 5.73. Ass, 3.57. Mare, 2.53. Buffalo, 4.247. Camel, 3.67. Sow, 5.30. Elephant, 3.212. Albumen, cow, 0 0.78. Goat, 1.26. Milk sugar, woman, 5.136. Cow, 4.34. Goat, 3.78. U, 3.96. Ass, 5.05. Mare, 5.42. Buffalo, 4.518. Camel, 5.78. Sow, 6.07. Hippopotamus, 1. Elephant, 7.392. Ash, woman. 0 0.223. Cow, 0 0.63. Goat, 0 0.65. U, 0 0.68. Mare, 0 0.29. Buffalo, 0 0.845. Camel, 0 0.66. Sow, 0 0.83. Hippopotamus, 0 0.11. Elephant, 0 0.629. It may be remarked that though approaching the composition of cream, it still differs enough to require it to be considered milk. Perhaps if a larger quantity of the milk could be collected, it would have a more watery character and approximate more nearly to other milks in that respect. However, this may be the quality of the fat deserves some attention. The fat has a light yellow color resembling olive oil, is very pleasant in odor and taste, is liquid at common temperatures but solidifies at 18 degrees Celsius or 64 degrees Fahrenheit. The cow must yield a considerable quantity of milk since the growth of the calf has been constant. And at the time these samples were milked, the mother gave as freely to her babe as she ever had since its birth, the calf having gained seven to eight hundred pounds on a milk diet in one year, it is presumable that it had no lack of nourishment. In size, the baby compared equally with other elephants in the same menagerie, who were known to be four and five years old. 
from whatever standpoint. Therefore, we view the lacteal product of these four-footed giants. We are fully warranted in ascribing to it not only extreme richness, but also great delicacy of flavor. End of section 10. Section 11 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. The Chemical Composition of Rice, Maize, and Barley by J. Steiner, F.C.S. Rice contains much more starch, but on the other hand much less albuminous matter and ash than maize and barley. The compositions of different kinds of dried rice do not vary very much, but as the amount of moisture in the raw grain ranges from 5 to 15 percent, no brewer ought to buy rice without having first of all inquired with the assistance of a chemist as to the percentage of water present in the sample. Another point requiring attention is that of taking notice of the acidity, which also varies a good deal for different sorts of rice. In comparing the nutritive values of the three kinds of grain before us, Pillets obtained the following numbers. Barley, air-dried, dried at 100 degrees Celsius. Maize, air dry, dried at 100 degrees Celsius. Rice, air dry, dried at 100 degrees Celsius, with husk. Moisture, 13.88, no. 13.89, no. 12.51, no. 12. Starch, 54.07. 62.65, Dextrin and sugar, 5.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 6.99, 
The amount of woody fiber or cellulose is considerable for rice with its husk, but only slight for samples without husk. The seat of the mineral matter of the grain of rice is mainly in the husk, and as this ash is very valuable as nourishment for the yeast plant, it is an open question whether it would not be preferable to use for brewing purposes rice with its husk. The comparatively largest amount of fat is contained in maize, and as such oil is not desirable for brewing purposes, different recommendations have been advanced for freeing the grain from it. In the following table, some of the mineral constituents of the three kinds of grain are compared with each other. These data refer to 100 parts of ash and are taken from analysis given by Dr. Emil Wolf. Potash, lime, magnesia, phosphoric acid, silica. 100 parts of grain contain ash. Barley, 21.9. 2.5, 8 8.3, 32.8, 27.2, 2 2.55%. Rice with husk, 18.4, 5 5.1, 8.6, 47.2, 0.6, 7.84%. 7 Rice without husk, 23.3, 3, 2.9, 13.4, 51, 3, 0.39%. Maize, 27, 2.7, 14.6, 44.7, 2.2, 1.42%. The excessive amount of ash in rice with its husk is very remarkable, and as this mineral matter consists to a great extent of phosphoric acid and potash, the larger part of it is soluble in water. Consequently, on using rice with its husk for brewing purposes, the yeast will be provided with a considerable amount of nutritive substance. In conclusion, it need hardly be mentioned that the use of rice with its husk would also be of considerable pecuniary advantage. There is very little oil in the husk of rice, as shown above by analysis, and it is not likely that the flavor of the brew would suffer by it. London Brewer's Journal End of Section 11《セクション12 A Scientific American Supplement》No.288 July 9, 1881 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Golden Co.《Scientific American Supplement》No.288 July 9, 1881 By various petroleum oils, nothing is in more general use than petroleum, and but few things are known less about. But the majority of persons, it is hydroheaded. It appears in many forms and under many names. Burning fluid is a popular name with many unscrupulous dealers in the cheap and nasty. Burning fluid is usually another name for naphtha or something worse. Gasoline, naphtha, benzene, kerosene, paraffin, and many other dangerous fluids, which make the fireman's vocation necessary, are all the product of petroleum. These oils are produced by the distillation or refining of crude petroleum, and inasmuch as the public, especially firemen, are daily brought into contact with them, it is proper that they should know something of their properties. Refining, as commonly practiced, involves three successive operations. The apparatus employed consists of an iron still connected with a coil or worm of wrought iron pipe, which is submerged in a tank of water for the purpose of cooling it. The end of this pipe is fixed with a movable spout, which can be transferred or switched from one to another of half a dozen pipes. 
which come around close to it, but which lead into different tanks containing different grades of the distillate. When the still has been filled with crude oil, the fire is lighted beneath it, and soon the oil begins to boil. The first products of distillation are gases which, at ordinary temperatures, pass through the coil without being condensed and escape. When the vapors begin to condense in the worm, the oil trickles from the end of the coil into the pipe, leading to the appropriate receiving tank. The first oil obtained is known as gasoline, used in portable gas machines for making illuminating gas. Then, in turn, come naphthas of a greater or less gravity. Benzene, high test water, white burning oil, such as Pratt's Astral, common burning oil or kerosene, and paraffin oils. When the oil has been distilled, it is by no means fit for use, having a dirty color and most offensive smell. It is then refined. For this purpose, it is pumped into a large vat or agitator, which holds from 250 to 1,000 barrels. There is then added to the oil about 2% of its volume of the strongest sulfuric acid. The whole mixture is then agitated by means of air pumps, which bring as much as possible every particle of oil in contact with the acid. The acid has no affinity for the oil, but it has for the tarry substance in it, which discolors it. And, after the agitation, the acid with the tar settles to the bottom of the agitator, and the mixture is drawn off into a lead-lined tank. After the removal of the acid and tar, the clear oil is agitated with either caustic soda or ammonia and water. The alkali neutralizes the acid remaining in the oil, and the water removes the alkali when the process of refining is finished. A few refiners improve the quality of the refined oil by redistillating it after treating it with acid and alkali. All distillates of petroleum have to be treated with acid and alkali to refine them. There is one thing peculiar about the distillates of petroleum, and that is the run which follows naphtha, which is called the middle run oil, is the highest test oil that is made running as high as 150 and 160 degrees flash, while the common oil which follows, viz., from 45 down to 33 degrees balm, will range at only about 100 flash, or 115 and 120 degrees burning less. An oil that will stand 100 flash will stand 110 burning test every time. Kerosene oil at an ordinary temperature should extinguish a match as readily as water. When heated, it should not evolve an inflammable vapor below 1 to 10 degrees, or, better, 1 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and should not take fire below 1 to 25 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. As the temperature in a burning lamp rarely exceeds 1 to degrees Fahrenheit, such an oil would be safe. It would produce no vapors to mix with the air in the lamp and make an explosive mixture. And, if the lamp should be overturned or broken, the oil would not be liable to take fire. The crude naphtha sells at from 3 to 5 cents per gallon, while the refined petroleum or kerosene sells at from 15 to 20 cents. As great competition exists among the refiners, there is a strong inducement to turn the heavier portions of the naphtha into the kerosene tank, so as to get for it the price of kerosene. In this way, the inflammable naphtha, or benzene, is sometimes mixed with the kerosene, rendering the whole highly dangerous. Dr. D. B. White, President of the Board of Health of New Orleans, found that experimenting on oil which flashed at 113 degrees Fahrenheit, an addition of 1% of naphtha caused it to flash at 103 degrees, 2%.
brought the flashing point down to 92 degrees, 5% to 83 degrees, 10% to 59 degrees, and 20% of natta added brought the flashing point down to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. After the addition of 20% of naphtha, the oil burned at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. There are two distinct tests for oil, the flashing test and the burning test. The flashing test determines the flashing point of the oil, or the lowest temperature at which it gives off an inflammable vapor. This is the most important test, as it is the inflammable vapor evolved at atmospheric temperatures that causes most accidents. Moreover, an oil which has a high flashing test is sure to have a high burning test, while the reverse is not true. The burning test fixes the burning point of the oil, or the lowest temperature at which it takes fire. The burning point of an oil is from 10 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, higher than the flashing point. The two points are quite independent of each other. The flashing point depends upon the amount of the most volatile constituents present, such as naphtha, etc., while the burning point depends upon the general character of the whole oil. 1% of naphtha will lower the flashing point of an oil 10 degrees without materially affecting the burning test. The burning test does not determine the real safety of the oil, that is, the absence of naphtha. The flashing test should, therefore, be the only test and the higher the flashing point, the safer the oil. In regard to the danger of using the lighter petroleum oils, the following under the head of naphtha and benzene under false names, is taken from Professor C. F. Chandler's article on petroleum in Johnson's Cyclopedia. He says, Processes have been patented, and vendors have sold rights throughout the country for patented and secret processes for rendering gasoline, naphtha, and benzene non-explosive. Thus treated, these explosive oils just as explosive as before the treatment, are sold throughout the country under trade names. These processes are not only totally ineffective, but they are ridiculous. Roots, gums, barks, and salts are turned indiscriminately into the benzene to leave it just as explosive as before. No wonder we have kerosene accidents, with agents scattered through the country selling county rights, and teaching retail dealers how to make these murderous, non-explosive oils. The experiments these vendors make to deceive their dupes are very convincing. None of the petroleum products are explosive per se, nor are their vapors explosive under all circumstances when mixed with air. A certain ratio of air to vapor is necessary to make an explosive mixture. Equal volumes of vapor and air will not explode. Three parts of air and one part of vapor gives a vigorous puff when ignited in a vessel. Five volumes of air to one of vapor gives a loud report. The maximum degree of violence results from the explosion of eight or nine parts of air mixed with vapor. It requires considerable skill to make at will an explosive mixture with air and naphtha. It is consequently very easy for the vendor not to make one. In most cases, the proportion of vapor is too great, and on bringing a flame in contact with the mixture, it burns quietly. The vendor, to make his oil appear non-explosive, unscrews the wick tube and applies a match when the vapor in the lamp quietly takes fire and burns without explosion. Or he pours some of the safety oil into a saucer and lights it. There is no explosion, and ignorant persons, biased by the saving of a few cents per gallon, purchase the most dangerous oils in the market. It is not possible to make gasoline, naphtha, or benzene safe by any addition that can be made to it nor is any oil safe that can be set on fire at the ordinary temperatures of the air. 
nothing but the most stringent laws, making it a state prison offense to mix naphtha and illuminating oil, or to sell any product of petroleum as an illuminating oil or fluid to be used in lamps, or to be burned, except in air gas machines, that will evolve an inflammable vapor below 100 degrees, or better, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, will be effectual in remedying the evil. In case of an accident from the sale of oil below the standard, the seller should be compelled to pay all damages to property, and, if a life is sacrificed, should be punished for manslaughter. It should be made extremely hazardous to sell such oils. Professor Chandler is professor of analytical chemistry, School of Mines, Columbia College. There is no substance on earth or under the earth which will chemically combine with naphtha or that will destroy its peculiar volatile and explosive properties. The manufacturers of petroleum products have exhausted the whole resources of chemistry to make this product available as a safe burning oil and their inability to do so proclaims the fact that it cannot be done. Chemistry has shown that naphtha and in fact, the other products of petroleum will not part with their hydrogen or change the nature of their compounds, except by decomposition from a union with oxygen, that is, by combustion. These humbugs who deceive people for their own gains may put camphor, salt, alum, potatoes, etc. into naphtha, and call it by whatever fancy name they please. The camphor is dissolved, the salt partially. Potatoes have no effect whatever. The camphor may disguise the smell of the naphtha, and sometimes merhain or burnt almonds may be used for the same purpose. But no matter what is used, the liability to explosion is not lessened in any degree. The stuff is always dangerous and always will be. There is not much danger in the use of kerosene, if it is of the standard required by law in several of the states. At the same time, petroleum is dangerous under certain conditions. Where oil is heated, it is more or less inflammable. And, in fact, inflammability is only a question of temperature of the oil after all. Burning oils should be kept in a moderately cool place, and always with care. Of course, if a lighted lamp is dropped and broken, the oil is liable to take fire. Though the lamp may be put out in the fall, or the light drowned by the oil, or the oil not take fire at all, this will be the effect if the oil is cool and of high flash test. When a lamp is lighted and remains burning for some time, it should never be turned down and set aside. The theory is that while lighting, a certain supply of gas is created from the oil, and that when the wick is turned down, that supply still continues to flow out and not being consumed, forms an inflammable gas in the chimney, which will explode when a sufficient quantity of air is mixed with it in the presence of light, which may happen if a person blows down the chimney. But a lamp should never be extinguished in that way. A good, high-test kerosene oil can be made with ordinary care as safe as sperm oil. Though, of course, it is not so safe as a matter of fact. We are sure to hear of it when an accident happens but we never hear of the reckless use of kerosene where an accident does not occur. And yet, there are few things so generally carelessly handled as burning oils. Fireman's Journal Composition of the Petroleum of the Caucasus by M. M. P. Schutzenberger and N. Tonine all portions of this petroleum contain saturated carbides of the formula CnH2n, which the authors name paraffines. 
At a bright red heat, they yield benzenic carbides, CnH2n-6, naphthalene, and a little anthracene. At dull redness, the products are along with unaltered paraffines, products which unite energetically with bromine, and which are converted into resinous polymers of ordinary sulfuric acid. It is difficult to isolate by means of fractional distillation, definite products with constant boiling points. End of section 12. Section 13 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9th, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9th, 1881, by Various. Notes on Kananga Oil or Ilang Ilang Oil by F. A. Flückiger This oil, on account of its fragrance, which is described by most observers as extremely pleasant, has attained to some importance, so that it appears to me not superfluous to submit the following remarks upon it and the plant from which it is derived. The tree of which the flowers yield the oil known under the name Ilang Ilang, or Alangilan, is the Kananga odorata, Hooker Fier et Thompson, of the order Ununacea, for which reason it is called also in many price lists Oleum Anone or Oleum Unone. It is not known to me whether the tree can be identified in the old Indian and Chinese literature. In the West, it was first named by Ray as Arbor Saguisan, the name by which it was called at that time at Luson. Rumpf gave a detailed description of the Bonga Kananga, as the Malays designate the tree, Champa, among the Javanese. Rumpf's figure, however, is defective. Further, Lamarck has short notices of it under Kanang Odorant, Uvaria Odorata. According to Roxburg, the plant was, in 1797, brought from Sumatra to the botanical gardens in Calcutta. Dunal devoted to the Ucaria odorata, or properly Unona odorata, as he himself corrected it, a somewhat more thorough description in his Monographique de la Famille des Anunaces, which principally repeats Rom's statements. Lastly, we owe a very handsome figure of the Kananga odorata to the magnificent Flora Jave of Blume. A copy of this, which in the original is beautifully coloured, is appended to the present notice. That this figure is correct, I venture to assume, after having seen numerous specimens in Geneva, with de Candol, as well as in the Delacert Herbarium, the unjustifiable name Unona Odoratissima, which incorrectly enough has passed into many writings, originated with Blanco, who, in his description of the powerful fragrance of the flowers, which in a closed sleeping room produces headache, was induced to use the superlative Odoratissima. Beyon designated as Canangium the section of the genus Uvaria, from which he would not separate the Ilang Ilang tree. The notice of Maximovich, über den Ursprung des Parfums, Ulang Ulang, contains only a confirmation of the derivation of the perfume from Kananga. Kananga odorata is a tree attaining to a height of 60 feet, with few but abundantly ramified branches. The shortly petioled, long, acuminate leaves, arranged in two rows, attain a length of 18 centimeters and a breadth of 7 centimeters. The leaf is rather caracious and slightly downy only along the nerves of the underside. The handsome and imposing looking flowers of the Kananga odorata occur to the number of four on short peduncles. The lobes of the tripartite leathery calyx are finally bent back. The six lanceolate petals spread out very neatly flat and grow to a length of seven centimeters and a breadth of about twelve millimeters. 
they are longitudinally veined of a greenish color and dark brown when dried the somewhat bell-shaped elegantly drooping flowers impart quite a handsome appearance although the floral beauty of other closely allied plants is far more striking the filaments of the kananga are very numerous the somewhat elevated receptacle has a shallow depression at the summit the green berry-like fruit is formed of from fifteen to twenty tolerably long stalked separate carpels which enclose three to eight seeds arranged in two rows the umbel-like peduncles are situated in the axils of the leaves or spring from the nodes of leafless branches the flesh of the fruit is sweetish and aromatic the flowers possess a most exquisite perfume frequently compared with hyacinth narcissus and cloves kananga odorata according to hooker and thompson or bentham and hooker is the only species of this genus the plants formerly classed together with it under the names unona or uvaria among which some equally possess odorous flowers are now distributed between those two genera which are tolerably rich in species from ovaria the kananga differs in its valvate petals and from unona in the arrangement of the seeds in two rows kananga odorata is distributed throughout all southern asia mostly however as a cultivated plant in the primitive forest the tree is much higher but the flowers are according to blume almost odorless in habit the kananga resembles the michelia champaca Linnaeus, of the family magnoliace an indian tree extraordinarily prized on account of the very pleasant perfume of its yellow flowers and which was already highly celebrated in ancient times in india among the admired fragrant flowers which are the most prized by the in this respect pampered javanese the champaca michelia champaca and the kenanga wangi kananga odorata stand in the first rank it is not known to me whether the oil of kananga was prepared in former times it appears to have first reached europe about eighteen sixty four in paris and london its choice perfume found full recognition the quantities evidently only very small that were first imported from the indian archipelago were followed immediately by somewhat larger consignments from manila where german pharmacists occupied themselves with the distillation of the oil oscar raymond and adolf ronsch of manila exhibited the ilang ilang oil in paris in eighteen seventy eight the former also showed the kananga flowers the oil of the flowers of the before-mentioned michelia champaca which stood next to it competes with the kananga oil or ilang ilang oil in respect to fragrance how far the latter has found acceptance is difficult to determine a lowering of the price which it has undergone indicates probably a somewhat larger demand at present it may be obtained in germany for about six hundred marks thirty pounds the kilogram since the kananga tree can be so very easily cultivated in all warm countries and probably everywhere bears flowers endowed with the same pleasant perfume it must be possible for the oil to be produced far more cheaply notwithstanding that the yield is always small it may be questioned whether the tree might not for instance succeed in algeria where already so many exotic perfumery plants are found according to gibor the macassar oil much prized in europe for at least some decades as a hair oil is a coconut oil digested with the flowers of kananga adorata and michelia champaca and colored yellow by means of turmeric in india unguents of this kind have always been in use the name kananga is met with in germany as occurring in former times an oleum destillatum kanange is mentioned by the leipzig apothecary johann heinrich link among some new exotics in the sammlung von natur und medizin wie auch hier zugehörigen kunst und literatur geschichten so sich anno siebzehnhundertundneunzehn in schlesien und andern ländern begeben leipzig und budesin siebzehnhundertundneunzehn as however 
The fruit of the same tree sent together with this Kananga oil is described by Link as uncommonly bitter. He cannot probably here refer to the present Kananga odorata, the fruit pulp of which is expressly described by Humphen by Blume as sweetish. Further, an oleum Kanangai, camel straw oil, occurs in 1765 in the tax of Bremen and Verden. It may remain undetermined whether this oil actually came from camel straw, the beautiful grass Andropogon laniger. From a chemical point of view, Kananga oil has become interesting because of the information given by Gall that it contains benzoic acid, no doubt in the form of a compound ether. So far as I, at the moment, remember the literature of the essential oils, this occurrence of benzoic acid in plants stands alone, although in itself it is not surprising, and probably the same compound will yet be frequently detected in the vegetable kingdom. As it was convenient to test the above statement by an examination, I induced Herr Adolf Konfert, a pharmaceutical student from Frankfurt on Main, to undertake an investigation of ilang ilang oil in that direction. The oil did not change litmus paper moistened with alcohol. A small portion distilled at 170 degrees Celsius, but the thermometer rose gradually to 290 degrees, and at a still higher temperature decomposition commenced. That the portions passing over below 290 degrees had a strong acid reaction already indicated the presence of ethers. Herr Confort boiled 10 grams of the oil with 20 grams of alcohol and 1 gram of potash during one day in a retort provided with a return condenser. Finally, the alcohol was separated by distillation, the residue supersaturated with dilute sulfuric acid, and together with much water submitted to distillation until the distillate had scarcely an acid reaction. The liquid that had passed over was neutralized with barium carbonate and the filtrate concentrated when it yielded crystals, which were recognized as nearly pure acetate. The acid residue, which contained the potassium sulfate, was shaken with ether. After the evaporation of the ether, there remained a crystalline mass having an acid reaction which was colored violet with ferric chloride. This reaction, which probably may be ascribed to the account of a phenol, was absent after the recrystallization of the crystalline mass from boiling water. The aqueous solution of the purified crystalline scales then gave, with ferric chloride, only a small flesh-colored precipitate. The crystals melted at 120 degrees Celsius. In order to demonstrate the presence of benzoic acid, her comfort boiled the crystals with water and silver oxide and dried the scales that separated from the cooling filtrate over sulfuric acid. 0.0312 gram gave upon combustion 0.0147 gram of silver, or 47.1%. The benzoate of silver contains 46.6% of metal. The crystals prepared from the acid of ilang ilang oil were, therefore, benzoate of silver. For the separation of the alcoholic constituent, which is present in the form of an apparently not very considerable quantity of benzoic ether, far more ilang ilang oil would be required than was at command. Besides the benzoic ether, and probably a phenol mentioned above, there may be recognized in ilang ilang oil an aldehyde or ketone, Inasmuch as upon shaking it with bisulfite of sodium, I observed the formation of a very small quantity of crystals. That Gall did not obtain the like result must at present remain unexplained. Like the benzoic acid, the acetic acid is, no doubt, present in Kananga oil in the form of ether. End of section 13《Science Fiction Supplement》Number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All recordings are in the public domain. Copyright 1921 by Harper Collins. Copyright 1922 by Harper Collins. Copyright 1923 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 by
a good deal has been heard about a product of our island that had quite fallen into disuse and which no one cared to gather so much had the demand fallen off because a substitute for it had been found in europe i mean cayenne turpentine as this product is destined to take a certain part in the treatment of cancer according to some english physicians permit me sir to give your readers a few interesting details obtained on the spot concerning the turpentine tree and its product the turpentine tree pistachia terebinthus l has existed in our island for many centuries judging from the enormous dimensions of some of these trees compared to with their slow rate of growth the trunks of some measure from four to five meters in circumference and their heights vary from fifteen to twenty meters on my own land there is an enormous tree by far the largest on the island the circumference of its trunk being six meters many of these great trees have been used in the construction of mills presses etc on account of the hardness of their wood it is in the vicinity of the town and in three or four neighboring villages that these trees are found today at a careful estimate there may be fifteen hundred trees capable of yielding two thousand kilos of turpentine mixed with at least thirty per cent of foreign matter there are no appliances for refining the product here except the sieves through which it is passed to remove the pebbles and bits of wood which are found in it it is gathered from incisions made in the tree in june axes are used for this purpose and the incision must be through the whole thickness of the bark through these outlets the turpentine falls to the foot of the tree and mixes with the earth there on its first appearance the turpentine is of a syrupy consistence and is quite transparent gradually it becomes more opaque and of a yellowish white color it is at this period also that it gives off its characteristic odor most abundantly it is however not the product turpentine that is the most esteemed by the natives but the fruit of the tree a kind of droop disposed in clusters the fruit is improved by the incisions made in the tree for the escape of the turpentine otherwise the resin having no other outlet would impregnate the former hinder its complete development and render it useless for the purposes for which it is cultivated one circumstance worth noting is that as soon as the fruit commences to ripen the flow of turpentine completely ceases this is towards august the fruit is then green it is gathered dried in the sun bruised and a fine yellowish green oil is drawn from it which is soluble in ether this oil is used for alimentary purposes but rarely for illumination since the introduction of petroleum it is mostly used in making sweet cakes and often as a substitute for butter in all cases where the latter is employed i use it daily myself without perceiving any difference i may here be permitted to correct a slight mistake that has crept into several standard botanical works it is therein stated that the inhabitants of this country extract from the fruit of the lentisk pistachio lentiscus a well-known shrub growing on this island from which chayan mastic is obtained an alimentary and illuminating oil this fruit has never been gathered for its oil within the memory of man the lentisk has probably been thus mistaken for the turpentine tree for the last twenty years the gathering of turpentine has been almost abandoned although the incisions in the trees have been regularly made but the value was so small that proprietors did not care to collect it and left it to run to waste there were but a few pharmacists of smyrna and the neighboring islands who took a small quantity for making medicinal plasters an utterly insignificant quantity found its way into europe how is it then that after so many years it was found in europe the problem is easily explained the greater part came from venice this is indubitable and lately an english chemist mr w martindale in a communication to the chemical society of london expressed doubts as to the authenticity of the turpentine used in the treatment of cancer if turpentine can really somewhat relieve this disease and if this treatment is generally accepted in europe i much fear you will only obtain substitutions of very inferior quality to the turpentine produced in our island this year the cayennes have been surprised by an extensive demand for this product from london in the first place and secondly from vienna and the proprietors 
although but poorly provided at the moment, sent away nearly 600 kilos. Paris has not yet made any demand. Yours, etc. Dr. Stipowicz, Chio, Turkey. Read by Ken Kowalik. April 22nd, 2023. Read at Ontario, Canada. Section 15 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9th, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ken Kowalik. Section 15. On the Change of Volume Which Accompanies the Galvanic Deposition of a Metal. By M. E. Booty. In previous notes, I have established, first, that the galvanic depositions experience a change of volume, from which there results a pressure exercised on the mold which receives them. Second, that the Peltier phenomenon is produced at the surface of contact of an electrode and of an electrolyte. Fresh observations have caused me to believe that the two phenomena are connected, and that the first is a consequence of the second. The Peltier effect can clearly be proved when the electrolysis is not interfered with by energetic secondary actions, and particularly with the sulfate and nitrate of copper, the sulfate and chloride of zinc, and the sulfate and chloride of cadmium. For any one of these salts, it is possible to determine a value, I, of the intensity of the current which produces the metallic deposits such that, for all the higher intensities, the electrode becomes heated and such that it becomes cold for less intensities. I will designate this intensity I, under the name of neutral point of temperatures. The new fact which I have observed is that in the electrolysis of the same salts, it is always possible to lower the intensity of the current below a limit, I, such that the compression produced by the deposit changes its direction, that is to say, instead of contracting, the metal dilates in solidifying. This change, although unquestionable, is sufficiently difficult to produce with a sulfate of copper. It is necessary to employ a negative electrode, a thermometer sensitive to one two hundredth of a degree, and to take most careful precautions to avoid accidental deformations of the deposit. But the phenomenon can be observed very early with nitrate of copper, the sulfate of zinc, and the chloride of cadmium. There is, therefore, a neutral point of compression in the same cases where there is a neutral point of temperatures. With the salts of iron, nickel, etc., for which the neutral point of temperatures cannot be arrived at, there is also no neutral point of compression, and the negative electrode always becomes heated, and the deposit obtained is always a compressing deposit. I have determined, by the help of observations made with ten different current strengths, the constants of the formula which I have explained elsewhere and which gives apparent excess y of the thermometer electrode compressed by the metallic deposit in terms of the time t during which the metal was depositing number 1 y equals at over b plus t the constant a is proportional to the variation of volume of the unit of volume of the metal the values of a without being exactly regular are sufficiently well represented within practical limits by the formula Number 2. A equals negative A exponent 1 times I plus B exponent 1 times I squared of the same form as the expression E. E equals negative A times I plus B times I squared of the heating of the thermometer electrode. Further, every cause which affects the coefficients A or B also affects in the same way A exponent 1 and B exponent 1. Such causes being the greater or less dilution of the solution, the nature of the salt, etc. It is, therefore, impossible not to be struck by the direct relation of the thermic and mechanical phenomena of which the negative electrode is the origin. The following is the explanation which I offer. The thermometer indicates the mean temperature of the liquid just outside it. This temperature is not necessarily that of the metal which encloses it. The current, propagated and almost exclusively by the molecules of the decomposed salt, 
does not act directly to cause a variation in the temperature of the dissolving molecules. These change heat with the molecules of the electrolyte, which should be in general hotter than those when a heating is noticed and colder when a cooling is observed. Suppose it is found, in the first case, that the metal, at the moment when it is deposited, is hotter than the liquid and, consequently, than the thermometer. It becomes colder immediately after the deposit and, consequently, contracts. The deposit is compressed. The reverse is the case when the metal is colder than the liquid. The deposit then dilates. If this hypothesis is correct, the excess, T, of the temperature of the metal over the liquid which surrounds the thermometer should be proportional to the contraction, A, represented by the formula, number 2, and the neutral point, I, of the contraction corresponds to the case where the temperature of the metal is precisely equal to that of the liquid. It might be expected, perhaps, from the foregoing, that I exponent 1 equals I. This would take place if the excess of temperature of the metal, measured by the contraction, were rigorously proportional to the heating of the liquid, for then the two quantities would be null at the same time. Careful experiment proves that this is not the case. The sulfate of copper gives compressing deposits on a thermometer which is undoubtedly cooling. Chloride of zinc of a density 200 can give expanding deposits on a thermometer which is heating. There is, therefore, no proportionality. But it must be remarked that the temperature of the metal which is deposited does not depend only on the quantities of heat disengaged in an interval of molecular thickness, which is infinitely small compared with the thickness of the layer, of which the variations of temperature are registered by the thermometer. There is nothing surprising, therefore, that the two variations of temperature, according exactly with one another, do not follow identically the same laws. Comptes rendus. End of section 15. Read by Ken Kowalik. Read in Ontario, Canada. February 19th, 2023. Section 16 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Analyses of Rice Soils from Burma by R. Romanus, D.S.C., Chemical Examiner, British Burma. The analyses of rice soils was undertaken at the instance of the Revenue Settlement Survey, who wanted to know if the chemical composition of the soil corresponded in any way to the valuation as fixed from other evidence. It was found that the amount of phosphoric acid in the soil in any one district corresponded pretty well with the settlement officer's valuation, but on comparing two districts, it was found that the district which was poor in phosphoric acid gave crops equal to the richer one. On inquiry, it was found that in the former, the rice is grown in nurseries and then planted out by hand, whereas in the latter, where the holdings are much larger, the grain is sown broadcast. The practice of planting out the young crops enables the cultivator to get a harvest 20% better than he would otherwise do, and hence the poorer land equals the richer. The deductions drawn from this investigation are, first, that climate and situation being equal, the value of soil depends on the phosphoric acid in it, and second, that the planting out system is far superior to the broadcast system of cultivation for rice. Results of the analyses of soils from Siriam near Rangoon are appended. Soluble in hydrochloric acid. Organic matter, 1, 4.590. 2, virgin soil, 8.508. Oxide of iron and alumina, 1, 8.939. 2, virgin soil, 8.938. 
7.179 Magnesia 1. 0 0.469 2. Virgin Soil 0 0.677 Lime 1. Trace 2. Virgin Soil 0 0.131 Potash 1. 0 0.138 2. Virgin Soil 0 0.187 Soda 1. 0 0.136 2. Virgin Soil, 0 0.337 Phosphoric Acid, 1. 0 0.100 2. Virgin Soil, 0 0.108 Sulfuric Acid, 1. 0 0.025 2. Virgin Soil, 0 0.117 Silica, 1. None 2. Virgin Soil, 0 0.005 Totals, 1. 14.397, 2. Virgin Soil, 17.249. Soluble in Sulfuric Acid, Alumina, 1. 17.460, 2. Virgin Soil, 15.684, Magnesia, 1. 0 0.459, 2. Virgin Soil, 0 0.446 Lime 1 0 0.286 2 Virgin Soil Trace Potash 1 0 0.616 2 Virgin Soil 1.250 Soda 1 0 0.317 2 Virgin Soil 0 0.285 Totals 1. 19.138 2. Virgin Soil, 17.665 Residue Silica Soluble, 1. 11.675 Silica Insoluble, 1. 49.477 2. Virgin Soil, Silica Soluble and Insoluble, 69.546 Alumina, 1, 3.062, 2, Virgin Soil, 4.178, Lime, 1, 0 0.700, 2, Virgin Soil, 0 0.134, Magnesia, 1, 0 0.212, 2, Virgin Soil, Trace, Potash, 1, 0 0.276, 2, Virgin Soil, 1.180 Soda 1 0 0.503 2 Virgin Soil 1.048 Totals 100 100 These are alluvial soils from the delta of the Irrawaddy. End of section 16《of Scientific American Supplement》No. 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ken Kowalik. Dry Air Refrigerating Machine A large number of scientific and other gentlemen interested in mechanical refrigeration lately visited the works of Messrs. J. and E. Hall of Dartford to inspect the working of one of their improved horizontal dry air refrigerators. The machine, which is illustrated below, is designed to deliver about 10,000 cubic feet of cold air per hour when running at the rate of 100 revolutions per minute and is capable of reducing the temperature of the air from 90 degree above to about 50 degree below zero Fahrenheit with an initial temperature of cooling water of 90 degree to 95 degree Fahrenheit. It can, however, be run at as high a speed as 140 revolutions per minute. The air is compressed in a water-jacketed, double-acting compression cylinder to about 55 pounds per square inch, more or less according to the temperature of the cooling water, the inlet valve being worked from a cam on the crankshaft to ensure a full cylinder of air at each stroke, and the outlet valves being self-acting, specially constructed to avoid noise in working and breakages which have given rise to so much annoyance in other cold air machines. The compressed air, 
still at a high temperature, is then passed through a series of tubular coolers, where it parts with a great deal of its heat, and is reduced to within 4 degrees or 5 degrees of the initial temperature of the cooling water. Here also, a considerable portion of the moisture, which, when fresh air is being used, must of necessity enter the compression cylinder, is condensed and deposited as water. After being cooled, the compressed air is then admitted to the expansion cylinder, but as it still contains a large quantity of water in solution, which, if expansion was carried immediately to atmospheric pressure, would, from the extreme cold, be converted into snow and ice, with a positive certainty of causing great trouble in the valves and passages. It is got rid of by a process invented by Mr. Lightfoot, which is at the same time extremely simple and beautiful in action and efficient. Instead of reducing the compressed air at once to atmospheric pressure, it is at first only partially expanded to such an extent that the temperature is lower to about 35 degree to 40 degree Fahrenheit, with the result that very nearly the whole of the contained aqueous vapor is condensed into water. The partially expanded air, which now contains water as a thick mist, is then admitted into a vessel containing a number of grids, through which it passes, parting all the while with its moisture, which gradually collects at the bottom and is blown off. The surface area of the grids is so arranged so that by the time the air has passed through them, it is quite free from moisture, with the exception of the very trifling amount which it can hold in solution at about 35 degree Fahrenheit and 30 pounds pressure. The expansion is then continued to atmospheric pressure and the cooled air containing only a trace of snow is then discharged ready for use into a meat chamber or elsewhere. In small machines, the double expansion is carried out in one cylinder containing a piston with a trunk, the annulus forming the first expansion and the whole piston area the second. But in larger machines, two cylinders of different sizes are used, just as in an ordinary compound engine. To compensate for the varying temperature of the cooling water, the cutoff valve to the first or primary expansion is made adjustable, and this can either be regulated as occasion requires by hand, or else automatically. The temperature in the depositors being kept constant under all variation in cooling water, there is the same abstraction of moisture in the tropics as in colder climates, and the cold air finally discharged from the machine is also kept at a uniform temperature. Diagram 1. Expansion cylinder. Scale 1 60th. 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature of entering air. Cooling water entering in at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Diagram 2. Expansion cylinder. Scale 1 60th. 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperature of entering air. Cooling water entering in at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. 125 revs per minute or 312 feet per minute for piston speed. The diagrams are reduced from the originals, taken from the compression cylinder when running at the speed of 125 revolutions per minute, and also from the expansion cylinder, the first when the cooling water was entering the coolers at 86 degrees Fahrenheit, and the latter when this temperature was reduced to 65 degrees Fahrenheit. In all cases, the compressed air is cooled down to within 3 degree to 5 degree of the initial temperature of the cooling water, thus showing the great efficiency of the cooling apparatus. The machine has been run experimentally at Dartford under conditions perhaps more trying than can possibly occur, even in the tropics, the air entering the compression cylinder being artificially heated up to 85 degree and being supersaturated at that temperature by a jet of steam laid on for the purpose. In this case, no more snow was formed than when dealing with air containing a very much less proportion of moisture. The vapor was condensed previous to final expansion and abstracted as water in the drying apparatus. The machine was exhibited at work in connection with a coal chamber which was kept at a temperature of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, besides which several hundred weight of ice were made in the few days during which the experiments lasted. This machine is in all respects an improvement on the machine which we have already illustrated. In that machine, Messrs. Hall were trammeled by being compelled to work to the plans of others. In the present case, the machine has been designed by Mr. Lightfoot and appears to leave little to be desired. 
It is a new thing that a cold air machine may be run at any speed from 32 to 120 revolutions per minute. In its action, it is perfectly steady and the cold air chamber is kept entirely clear of snow. The dimensions of the machine are also eminently favorable to its use on board ship. The Engineer End of Section 17 Read by Ken Kowalik Reddit, Ontario, Canada March 24, 2023section 18 of scientific american supplement number 288 july 9th 1881 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Thomas's Improved Steam Wheel The rotary, or steam wheel, the invention of J. E. Thomas of Carlinville, Illinois, shown in the annexed figure, consists of a wheel with an iron rim enclosed within a casing or jacket from which nothing protrudes except the axle which carries the driving pulley and the grooved distributing disc within this jacket which need not necessarily be steam tight there is a movable piece k which pressing against the rim renders steam tight the channel in which the pistons move when driven by the steam at the extremities of this channel there are plates which are kept pressed against the wheel by means of spiral springs thus rendering the channel perfectly tight the steam enters the closed space which forms one-fourth of the circumference through the side valve s presses against the pistons d and causes the wheel to revolve in the direction of the arrows the slide valve is closed by the action of the external distributing mechanism the piston passes beyond the steam outlet a and a new piston then comes in play altogether there are six of these pistons each one working in an aperture in the rim and kept pressed outwardly by means of a spiral spring the steam acts constantly on the same lever arm and meets no counter pressure the other defects likewise of the ordinary steam engines in use are obviated to such an extent that the effective power of the steam wheel is fifty per cent greater than that of other and more complicated machines at least this is the experience of the inventor to the inner ends of the pistons there are attached rods which pass through the rim of the wheel where they are provided with stuffing boxes and a butt against spiral springs these rods are in addition connected with levers h which are pivoted on the spokes of the wheel and whose other extremities carry rods too these latter run through guides on the external face of the rim of the wheel and engage by means of friction rollers in an undulating groove formed in the inner surface of the jacket when a piston arrives in front of the upper extremity of the steam channel the friction roller at that moment enters one of the depressions in the groove and thus lifts up the piston and allows it to pass freely beyond the plate which closes the channel end of section eighteen section nineteen of scientific american supplement number two eight eight july ninth eighteen eighty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. The American Society of Civil Engineers. Address of the President, James Piceno, Francis, at the 13th Annual Convention of the Society at Montreal, June 15, 1881. You have assembled in convention for the first time outside the limits of the United States, and I congratulate you on the selection of this beautiful city, in which, and its immediate neighborhood, there are so many interesting engineering works, constructed with the skill and solidarity characteristic of the British School of Engineering. Nine of our members are Canadian engineers, which must be the excuse of the other members for invading foreign territory. The Society was organized November 3rd, 1852, and actively maintained up to March 2nd, 1855. Eleven only of the present members date from this period. October 2nd, 1867, the Society was reorganized on a wider basis, and from that time to the present it has been constantly increasing in interest and usefulness. The membership of the Society is now as follows. Honorary members, 11. Corresponding members, 3. Members, 491. Associates, 21. Juniors, 57. Fellows, 53. Total, 636. During the last year we have lost 6 members by death and 5 by resignation, and 56 new members have been elected and qualified. The most interesting event to the Society since the last convention has been the purchase of a house in the city of New York as a permanent home, at a cost of $30,000. This has been accomplished, so far, without taxing the resources of the Society, the required payments having been met by subscription. The sum of 11900 had been subscribed to building the fund up to the 25th ULT by 70 members, and 29 friends of the Society who are not members. The subscription is still open, and it is expected that large additions will be made to it by members and their friends to enable the Society to make the remaining payments without embarrassment. Meetings of the Society are held twice in each month during ten months in the year, for the reading and discussion of papers and other purposes. The new house affords much better accommodations for these purposes than we have ever had before, and also for the library, which now contains 8,850 books and pamphlets, and is constantly increasing. A catalog of the library is being prepared. Part 1, Embracing Railroads and the Transactions of Scientific Societies, has been printed and furnished to members. Water Power Water power in many of the states is abundant and contributes largely to their prosperity. Its proper development calls for the services of the civil engineer, and as it is the branch of the profession with which I am most familiar, I propose to offer a few remarks on the subject. The earliest applications were to grist and sawmills. Carding and fulling mills soon followed. These were essential to the comfort of the early settlers who relied on home industries, for shelter, food, and clothing, but with the progress of the country came other requirements. The earliest application of water power to general manufacturing purposes appears to have been at Patterson, New Jersey, where the Society for Establishing Useful Manufactures was formed in the year 1791. The Passaic River at this point furnishes, when at minimum, about 1100 horsepower continuously night and day. The water power at Lowell, Massachusetts, was begun to be improved for general manufacturing purposes in 1822. The Merrimack River at this point has a fall of 35 feet and furnishes, at minimum, about 10,000 horsepower during the usual working hours. At Cahos, in the state of New York, the Mohawk River has a fall of about 105 feet, which was brought into use systemically very soon after that at Lowell and could furnish about 14,000 horsepower during the usual working hours, but the works are so arranged that part of the power is not available at present. At Manchester, New Hampshire, the present works were commenced in 1835, 
The Merrimack River at this point has a fall of about 52 feet and furnishes, at a minimum, about 10,000 horsepower during the usual working hours. At Lawrence, Massachusetts, the Essex County built a dam across the Merrimack River commencing in 1845 and making a fall of about 28 feet and a minimum power, during the usual working hours, of about 10,000 horsepower. At Holyoke, Massachusetts, the Hadley Falls Company commenced their works about 1845 for developing the power of the Connecticut River at that point, where there is a fall of about 50 feet and at a minimum about 17,000 horsepower during the usual working hours. At Lewiston, Maine, the fall in the Onsicogan River is about 50 feet. Its systemic development was commenced about 1845, and with the improvement of the large natural reservoirs at the headwaters of the river now in progress, it is expected that a minimum power during the usual working hours of about 11,000 horsepower will be obtained. At Birmingham, Connecticut, the Housatonic Water Company have developed the water power of the Housatonic River by a dam, giving 22 feet fall, furnishing at a minimum about 1,000 horsepower during the usual working hours. The Dundee Water and Land Company, about 1858, developed the power of the Passaic River at Passaic, New Jersey, where there is a fall of about 22 feet, giving a minimum power during the usual working hours of about 900 horsepower. The Turner Falls Company, in 1866, commenced the development of the power of the Connecticut River at Turner Falls, Massachusetts, by building a dam on the Middle Fall, which is about 35 feet, and furnishes a minimum power during the usual working hours of about 10,000 horsepower. I have named the above water powers as being developed in a systemic manner from their inception, and of which I have been able to obtain some data. In the usual process of developing a large water power, a company is formed, who acquired the title to the property, embracing the land necessary for the site of the town to accommodate the population which is sure to gather around an improved water power. The dam and canals are races are constructed, and mill sites, with accompanying rights to use the water, are granted, usually by perpetual leases subject to annual rents. This method of developing water power is distinctly an American idea, yeah, and the only instance where it has been attempted abroad that I know of is at Bellegarde in France, where there is a fall in the Rhone of about 33 feet. Within the last few years, works have been constructed for its development, furnishing a large amount of power, but from the great outlay incurred in acquiring the titles to the property and other difficulties, it has not been a financial success. The water powers I have named are but a small fraction of the whole amount existing in the United States and the adjoining Dominion of Canada. There is Niagara, with its two or three millions of horsepower, the St. Lawrence, with its succession of falls from Lake Ontario to Montreal, the Falls of St. Antony at Minneapolis, and many other falls with large volumes of water on the upper Mississippi and its branches. It would be a long story to name even the large water powers, and the smaller ones are almost innumerable. In the state of Maine, a survey of the water power has recently been made, the result, as stated in the official report, being between one and two millions of horsepower, part of which will probably not be available. There is an elevated region in the northern part of the South Atlantic states exceeding in area 100,000 square miles in which there is a vast amount of water power, and being near the cotton fields with a fine climate, free from malaria, its only needs are railways, capital, and population to become a great manufacturing section. The design and construction of the works for developing a large water power, together with the necessary arrangements for utilizing it and providing for its subdivision among the parties entitled to it according to their respective rights, affords an extensive field for civil engineers, and in view of the vast amount of it yet undeveloped, but which, with the increase of population and the constantly increasing demand for mechanical power as a substitute for hand labor, must come into use. The field must continue to enlarge for a long time to come. There are many cases in which the power of a waterfall can be made available by means of compressed air more conveniently than by ordinary motors. 
The fall may be too small to be utilized by the ordinary motors. The site where the power is wanted may be too distant from the waterfall. Or it may be desired to distribute the power in small amounts at distant points. A method of compressing air by means of a fall of water has been devised by Mr. Joseph P. Frizzell, C.E., of St. Paul, Minnesota, which, from the extreme simplicity of the apparatus, promises to find useful applications. The principle on which it operates is, by carrying the air in small bubbles in a current of water down a vertical shaft to the depth giving the desired compression, then through a horizontal passage in which the bubbles rise into a reservoir near the top of this passage, the water passing on and rising in another vertical or inclined passage, at the top of which it is discharged, of course, at a lower level than it first entered the shaft. The formation at waterfalls is usually rock, which would enable the passages and the reservoir for collecting the compressed air to be formed by simple excavations with no other apparatus than that required to charge the descending volume of water with the bubbles of air, which can be done by throwing the water into violent commotion at its entrance, and a pipe and valve for the delivery of the air from the reservoir. The transfer of power by electricity is one of the problems now engaging the attention of electricians, and it is now done in Europe in a small way. Sir William Thompson stated in evidence before an English parliamentary committee two years ago that he looked forward to the falls of Niagara being used extensively for the production of light and mechanical power over a large area of North America, and that a copper wire half an inch in diameter would transmit 21,000 horsepower from Niagara to Montreal, Boston, New York, or Philadelphia. His statements appear to have been based on theoretical considerations, but there is no longer any doubt as to the possibility of transferring power in this manner. Its practicability for industrial purposes must be determined by trial. Dr. Paget Higgs, a distinguished English electrician, is now experimenting on it in the city of New York. Great improvements in reaction water wheels have been made in the United States within the last 40 years. In the year 1844, the late Uriah Atherton Boyden, a civil engineer of Massachusetts, commenced the design and construction of Fourieron turbines, in which he introduced various improvements and a general perfection of form and workmanship, which enabled the larger percentage of the theoretical power of the water to be utilized than had been previously attained. The great results obtained by Boyden with water wheels made in this perfect manner, and, in some instances, almost regardless of cost, undoubtedly stimulated others to attempt to approximate to these results at less cost, and there are now many forms of wheel of low cost giving fully double the power, with the same consumption of water, that was obtained from most of the older forms of wheels of the same class. Anchor Ice a frequent inconvenience in the use of water power in cold climes is that peculiar form of ice called anchor or ground ice. It adheres to the stones, gravel, wood, and other substances forming the beds of streams, the channels of conduits, and orifices through which water is drawn, sometimes rising the level of water courses by many feet by its accumulation on the bed, and entirely closing small orifices through which water is drawn for industrial purposes. I have been for many years in a position to observe its effects and the conditions under which it is formed. The essential conditions are that the temperature of the water is at its freezing point and that of the air below that point. The surface of the water must be exposed to the air and there must be a current in the water. The ice is formed in small needles on the surface, which would remain there and form a sheet if the surface was not too much agitated except for a current or movement in the body of water sufficient to maintain it in a constant state of intermixture. Even when flowing in a regular channel, there is a continued interchange of position of the different parts of a stream. The retardation of the bed causes variations in the velocity, which produces whirls and eddies and a general instability in the movement of the water in different parts of the section the result being that the water at the bottom soon finds its way to the surface and the reverse. I found by experiments on straight canals in earth and masonry 
by colored water discharged at the bottom reached the surface at distances varying from 10 to 30 times the depth. In natural water courses, in which the beds are always more or less irregular, the disturbance would be much greater. The result is that the water at the surface of a running stream does not remain there, and, when it leaves the surface, it carries with it the needles of ice, the specific gravity of which differs but a little from that of the water, which, combined with their small size, allows them to be carried by the currents of water in any direction. The converse effect takes place in muddy streams. The mud is apparently held in suspension, but is only prevented from subsiding by the constant intermixture of the different parts of the stream. When the current ceases, the mud sinks to the bottom, the earthy particles composing it, being heavier than water, would sink in still water in times inversely proportional to their size and specific gravity. This, I think, is a satisfactory explanation of the manner in which the ice formed at the surface finds its way to the bottom. Its adherence to the bottom, I think, is explained by the phenomenon of regulation, first observed by Faraday. He found that when the wetted surfaces of two pieces of ice were pressed together, they froze together, and that this took place under water even when above the freezing point. Professor James D. Forbes found that the same thing occurred by mere contact without pressure, and that ice would become attached to other substances in a similar manner. Regulation was observed by these philosophers in carefully arranged experiments with repaired surfaces fitting together accurately, and kept in contact sufficiently long to allow the freezing together to take place. In nature, these favorable conditions would seldom occur in the masses of ice commonly observed, but we must admit, on the evidence of the recorded experiments, that, under particular circumstances, pieces of ice will freeze together or adhere to other substances in situations where there can be no abstraction of heat. When a piece of ice of considerable size comes in contact underwater with ice or other substance, it would usually touch in an area very small in proportion to its mass, and other forces acting upon it, and tending to move it, would usually exceed the freezing force, and regulation would not take place. In the minute needles formed at the surface of the water, the tendency to adhere would be much the same as in larger masses touching at small points only, while the external forces acting upon them would be extremely small in proportion, and regulation would often occur, and of the immense number of needles of ice formed at the surface, enough would adhere to produce the effect which we observe and call anchor ice. The adherence of the ice to the bed of the stream or other objects is always downstream from the place where they are formed. In large streams, it is frequently many miles below. In large part of them do not become fixed, but as they come in contact with each other, regulate and form spongy masses, often of considerable size, which drift along with the current, and are often troublesome impediments to the use of water power. Water power is supplied directly from ponds or rivers, or canals frozen over for a long distance immediately above the places from which the water is drawn, are not usually troubled with anchor ice, which, as I have stated, requires open water upstream for its formation. End of section 19. Section 20 of Scientific American Supplement, number 228, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Quartertone. Scientific American Supplement, number 228, July 9, 1881, by Various. Delicate Scientific Instruments, by Edgar L. Larkin. New Windsor Observatory, New Windsor, Illinois. Within the past five years, scientific men have surpassed previous efforts in close measurement and refined analysis. By means of instruments of exceeding delicacy, processes in nature hitherto unknown are made palpable to sense. Heat is found in ice, light in seeming darkness, and sound in apparent silence. It seems that physicists and chemists have almost, if not quite, reached the ultimate atoms of matter. The mechanism must be sensitive, as such properties of matter as heat, 
light, electricity, magnetism, and actinism are to be handled, caused to vanish and reappear, analyzed and measured. With such instruments, nature is scrutinized, revealing new properties, strange motions, vibrations, and undulations. Throughout the visible universe, the faintest pulsations of atoms are detected, and countless millions of infinitely small waves bearing light, heat, and sound are discovered and their lengths determined. Refined spectroscopic analysis of light is now made so that when any material burns, no matter what its distance, its spectrum tells what substance is burning. When any luminous body appears, it can be told whether it is approaching or receding, or whether it shines by its own or reflected light. Whence it is seen that rays falling on earth from a flight of a hundred years are as sounding lines dropped in the appalling depths of space. We wish to describe a few of these intricate instruments and mention several far-reaching discoveries made by their use, beginning with the mechanism for the manipulation of light. Optics is based on the accidental discovery that a piece of glass of certain shape will draw light to a focus, forming an image of any object at that point. The next step was in learning that this image can be viewed with a microscope and magnified. Thus came the telescope revealing unheard of suns and galaxies. The first telescopes colored everything looked at, but by a hundred years of mathematical research, the proper curvature of objectives formed of two glasses was discovered, so that now we have perfect instruments. Great results followed. One can now peer into the profound solitudes of space, bringing to view millions of stars requiring light 5,000 years to traverse their awful distance, and behold suns wheeling around suns, and thousands of nebulae, or agglomerations of stars so distant as to send us confused light, appearing like faint gauze-like structures in measureless voids. The modern telescope has astonishing power thus. When Mr. Clark finished the great 26-inch equatorial, now at Washington, he tested its seeing properties. A photographic calligraph, whose letters were so fine as to require a microscope to see them, was placed at a distance of 300 feet. Mr. Clark turned the great eye upon the invisible thing and read the writing with ease. But a greater feat than this was accomplished by the same instrument— the discovery of the two little moons of Mars by Professor Asaph Hall in 1877. They are so small as to be incapable of measurement by ordinary means, but with an ingenious photometer devised by Professor Pickering of Harvard College, he determined the outer satellite to be six and the inner seven miles in diameter. The discovery of these minute bodies seems past belief, and will appear more so when it is told that the task is equal to that of viewing a luminous ball two inches in diameter suspended above Boston by the telescope situated in the city of New York. Newcomb and Holden's Astronomy, page 338. Phobos, the nearest moon, is only 4,000 miles from the surface of Mars and is obliged to move with such great velocity to prevent falling that it actually makes a circuit about its primary in only 7 hours and 38 minutes. But Mars turns on its axis in 24 hours and 37 minutes, so the moon goes round three times while Mars does once. Hence it rises in the west and sets in the east, making one day of Mars equal three of its months. This moon changes every two hours, passing all phases in a single martial night, is anomalous in the solar system, and tends to subvert that theory of cosmic evolution wherein a rotating gaseous sun cast off concentric rings afterward becoming planets. Astronomers were not satisfied with the telescope. True, they beheld the phenomena of the solar system, planets rotating on axes and satellites revolving about them, they saw sunspots, faculae, and solar upheaval, watched eclipses, transits, and the alternations of summer and winter on Mars, and detected the laws of gravity and motion in the system to which the Earth belongs. They then devised the micrometer. This is a complex mechanism placed in the focus of a telescope, and by its use any object, providing it shows a disk, no matter what its distance, can be measured. It consists of spider webs set within a graduated metallic circle, the webs movable by screws, and the whole instrument capable of rotating about the collimation axis of the telescope. 
The screw head is a circle ruled to degrees and minutes and turns in front of a fixed vernier in the field of a reading microscope. One turn of the screw moves the web a certain number of seconds. Then, as there are 360 degrees in a circle, one 360th of a turn moves the web one 360th of the amount, and so on. Thus, when two stars are seen in the field, one web is moved by the screw until the fixed line and the movable one are parallel, each bisecting a star. By reading with the microscope the number of degrees turned, the distance apart of the stars becomes known. The distance being learned, position is then sought the observation of which led to one of the greatest discoveries ever made by man. The permanent line of the micrometer is placed in the line joining the north and south poles of the heavens and brought across one of the stars. The movable web is then rotated until it bisects the other, and then the angle between the webs is recorded. Double stars are thus measured, first in distance and second their position. After this, if any movement of the stars takes place, the telltale micrometer at once detects it. In 1780, Sir William Herschel measured double stars and made catalogues with distances and positions. Within twenty years, he startled intellectual man with the statement that many of the fixed stars actually move, one great sun revolving around another and both rotating about their common center of gravity. If we look at a double star with a small telescope, it looks just like any other. Using a little larger glass, it changes the appearance and looks elongated. With a still better telescope, they become distinctly separated and appear as two beautiful stars whose elements are measured and carefully recorded in order to see if they move. Herschel detected the motion of 50 of these systems and revolutionized modern astronomy. Astronomers soared away from the little solar system and began a minute search throughout the whole sidereal heavens. Herschel's catalog contained 400 double suns, only 50 of which were known to be in revolution. Since then, enormous advances have been made. The micrometer has been improved into an instrument of great delicacy, and the number of doubles has swelled to 10,000. 650 of them being known to be binary or revolving on orbits, Professor S. W. Burnham, the distinguished young astronomer of the Dearborn Observatory, Chicago, having discovered 800 within the last eight years. This discovery implies stupendous motion. Every fixed star is a sun like our own, and we can imagine these wheeling orbs to be surrounded by cool planets, the abode of life, as well as ours. If the orbit of a binary system lies edgewise toward us, then one star will hide the other each revolution, moving across it and appearing on the other side. Several instances of this motion are known, the distant suns having made more than a complete circuit since discovery, the shortest periodic time known being 25 years. Wonderful as was this achievement of the micrometer, one not less surprising awaited its delicate measurement. If one walks in a long street lighted with gas, the lights ahead will appear to separate, and those in the rear approach. The little spider lines have detected just such a movement in the heavens. The stars in Hercules are all the time growing wider apart, while those in Argus, in exactly the opposite part of the universe, are steadily drawing nearer together. This demonstrates that our sun, with his stately retinue of planets, satellites, comets, and meteorites, all move in grand march toward the constellation Hercules. The entire universe is in motion, but these revelations of the micrometer are tame compared with its final achievement, the discovery of parallax. This means difference of direction, and the parallax of a star is the difference of its direction when viewed at intervals of six months. Astronomers observe a star today with a powerful telescope and micrometer, and in six months again measure the same star. But meanwhile, the Earth has moved 183 million miles to the east, so that if the star has changed place, this enormous journey caused it, and the change equals a line 91,400,000 miles long as viewed from the star. For years, many such observations were made, but behold, the star was always in the same place. 
the whole distance of the sun having dwindled down to the diameter of a pinpoint in comparison with the awful chasm separating us from the stars. Finally, micrometers were made that measured lines requiring 100,000 to make an inch, and a new series of observations began, crowning the labors of a century with success. Finite man actually told the distance of the starry hosts and gauged the universe. When the parallax of any object is found, its distance is at once known, for the parallax is an arc of a circle whose radius is the distance. By an important theorem in geometry, it is learned that when anything subtends an angle of one second, its distance is 206,265 times its own diameter. The greatest parallax of any star is that of Alpha Centauri, nine-tenths of a second. Hence, it is more than 206,265 times 91,400,000 miles the distance of the sun away, or 20,000 billions of miles. This is the distance of the nearest fixed star, and is used as a standard of reference in describing greater depths of space. This is not all the micrometer enables man to know. When the distance separating the Earth from two celestial bodies that revolve is learned, the distance between the two orbs becomes known. Then the period of revolution is learned from observation, and having the distance and time, then their velocity can be determined. The distance and velocity being given, then the combined weights of both suns can be calculated, since by the laws of gravity and motion it is known how much weight is required to produce so much motion in so much time at so much distance, and thus man weighs the stars. If the density of these bodies could be ascertained, their diameters and volumes would be known, and the size of the fixed stars would have been measured. Density can never be exactly learned, but strange to say, photometers measure the quantity of light that any bright body emits. Hence, the stars cannot have a specific gravity very far different from that of the sun, since they send similar light and in quantity obeying the laws wherein light varies inversely as the squares of distance. Therefore, knowing the weight and having close approximation to density, the sizes of the stars are nearly calculated. The conclusion is now made that all suns within the visible universe are neither very many times larger nor smaller than our own. Newcomb and Holden's Astronomy, page 454. Another result followed the use of the micrometer, the detection of the proper motion of the stars. For several thousand years, the stars have been called fixed, but the fine rulings of the Filer micrometer tells a different story. There are catalogues of several hundred moving stars whose motion is from one half second to eight seconds annually. The binary star, 61 Cygni, the nearest north of the equator, moves 8 seconds every year, a displacement equal in 360 years to the apparent diameter of the moon. The fixed stars have no general motion toward any point, but move in all directions. Thus, the micrometer revealed to man the magnitude and general structure together with the motions and revolutions of the sidereal heavens. Above all, it demonstrated that gravity extends throughout the universe. Still, the longings of men were not appeased. They brought to view invisible suns sunk in space and told their weight, yet the thirst for knowledge was not quenched. Men wished to know what all the suns are made of, whether of substances like those composing the earth or of kinds of matter entirely different. Then was devised the spectroscope, and with it, men audaciously question nature in her most secluded recesses. The basis of spectroscopy is the prism, which separates sunlight into seven colors and projects a band of light called a spectrum. This was known for 300 years, and not much thought of it, until Fraunhofer viewed it with a telescope and was surprised to find it filled with hundreds of black lines invisible to the unaided eye. Could it be possible that there are portions of the solar surface that fail to send out light? Such is the fact, and then began a twenty years' search to learn the cause. The lines in the solar spectrum were unexplained until finally metals were vaporized in the intense heat of the electric arc and the light passed through a spectroscope. 
when, behold, the spectra of metals were filled with bright lines in the same places as were the dark lines in the spectrum of the sun. Another step, if when metals were volatized in the arc, rays of light from the sun are passed through the vapor and allowed to enter the spectroscope, a great change is wrought. A reversal takes place, and the original black bands reappear. A new law of nature was discovered thus. Vapors of all elements absorb the same rays of light which they emit when incandescent. Every element makes a different spectrum with lines in different places and of different widths. These have been memorized by chemists, so that when an expert having a spectroscope sees anything burn, he can tell what it is as well as read a printed page. Men have learned the alphabet of the universe, and can read in all things radiating light the constituent elements. The black lines in the solar spectrum are there because in the atmosphere of the sun exist vapors of metals, and the light from the liquid metals below is unable to pass through and reach the earth, being absorbed kind for kind. Gaseous iron sifts out all rays emitted from melted iron, and so do the vapors of all the other elements in the sun, radiating light in unison with their own. Sodium, iron, calcium, hydrogen, magnesium, and many other substances are now known to be incandescent in the sun and stars, and the results of the developments of the spectroscope may be summed up in the generalization that all bodies in the universe are composed of the same substance the earth is. The sun is subject to terrific hurricanes and cyclones as well as explosions, casting up jets to the height of 200,000 miles. In the early days of spectroscopy, these protuberances could only be seen at a time of a total solar eclipse, and astronomers made long journeys to distant parts of the Earth to be in line of totality. Now all is changed. Images of the sun are thrown into the observatory by an ingenious instrument run by clockwork and called a heliostat. This is set on the sun at such an angle as to throw the solar image into the objective of the telescope placed horizontally in a darkened observatory, and the pendulum ball set in motion when it will follow the sun without moving its image all day if desired. At the eye end of the telescope is attached the spectroscope and the micrometer, and the whole set of instruments so adjusted that just the edge of the sun is seen making a half-spectrum. The other half of the spectroscope projects above the solar limb and is dark, so if an explosion throws up liquid jets or flames of hydrogen, the astronomer at once sees them and with the micrometer measures their height before they have time to fall. And the spectrum at once tells what the jets are composed of, whether hydrogen, gaseous iron, calcium, or anything else. Professor C. A. Young saw a jet of hydrogen ascend a distance of 200,000 miles, measured its height, noted its spectrum, and timed its ascent by chronometer all at once, and was astonished to find the velocity 160 miles per second, eight times faster than the Earth flies in its orbit. By these improvements, solar hurricanes, whirlpools, and explosions can be seen from any physical observatory on clear days. The slit of the spectroscope can be moved anywhere on the disk of the sun, so that if the observer sees a tornado begin, he moves the slit along with it, measures the length of its tract and velocity. With the telescope, micrometer, heliostat, and spectroscope came desire for more complex instruments, resulting in the invention of the photoheliograph, invoking the aid of photography to make permanent the results of these exciting researches. This mechanism consists of an excessively sensitive plate adjusted in the solar focus of the telespectroscope. In front of the plate in the camera is a screen attached to a spring and held closed by a cord. The eye is applied to the spectroscopic end of the complex arrangement to watch the development of solar hurricanes. Finally, an appalling outburst occurs. The flames leap higher and higher, torn into a thousand shreds, presenting a scene that language is powerless to describe. When the display is at the height of its magnificence, the astronomer cuts the cord. The slide makes an exposure of one three thousandth part of a second, and an accurate photograph is taken. The storm in rapid motion is petrified on the plate. Everything is distinct. 
all the surging billows of fire, boilings, and turbulence are rendered motionless with the velocity of lightning. At Meudon, in France, M. Janssen takes these instantaneous photographs of the sun, 30 inches in diameter, and afterward enlarges them to 10 feet, showing scenes of fiery desolation that appalls the human imagination. See address of Vice President Langley, AAAS, Proceedings, Saratoga Meeting, page 56. This huge photograph can be viewed in detail with a small telescope and micrometer, and the crests of solar waves measured. Many of these billows of fire are in dimensions every way equal in size to the state of Illinois. Binary stars are photographed so that in time to come they can be retaken when, if they have moved, the precise amount can be measured. Another instrument is the telepolariscope to be attached to a telescope. It tells whether any luminous body sends us its own or reflected light. Only one comet bright enough to be examined has appeared since its perfection. This was Kojia's, and was found to reflect solar from the tail and to radiate its own light from the nucleus. Still another intricate instrument is in use, the thermograph, that utilizes the heat rays from the sun instead of the light. It takes pictures by heat. In other words, it sees in the dark, brings invisible things to the eye of man, and is used in astronomical and physical researches wherein undulations and radiations are concerned. And now comes the magnetometer to measure the amount of magnetism that reaches the earth from the sun. It points to zero when the magnetic forces of the earth are in equilibrium, but let a magnetic storm occur anywhere in the world and the pointer will move by invisible power. It detects a close relation between the magnetism of the earth and sun. The needle is deflected every time a solar disturbance takes place. At Kew, England, an astronomer was viewing the sun with a telescope and observed a tongue of flame dart across a spot whose diameter was 33,700 miles. The magnetometer was violently agitated at once, showing that whatever magnetism may be, its influence traversed the distance of the sun with a velocity greater than that of light. Not less remarkable is the new instrument, the thermal balance, devised by Professor S. P. Langley, Pittsburgh. It will measure the one fifty thousandth part of a degree of heat, and consists of strips of platinum one thirty second of an inch wide and one fourth of an inch long, and so thin that it requires fifty to equal the thickness of tissue paper, placed in the circuit of electricity running to a galvanometer. When mounted in a reflected telescope, it will record the heat from the body of a man or other animal in adjoining field, and can do so at great distances. It will do this equally well at night, and may be said, in a certain sense, to give the power of seeing in the dark. Science, issue of January 8, 1881, page 12. It is expected to reveal great facts concerning the heat of the stars. Indeed, the thermopile in the hands of Lockyer has already made palpable the heat of the fixed stars. He placed the little detective in the focus of a telescope and turned it on Arcturus. The result was this, that the heat received from Arcturus, when at an altitude of 55 degrees, was found to be just equal to that received from a cube of boiling water, three inches across each side, at the distance of 400 yards and the heat from Vega is equal to that from the same cube at 600 yards. Lockyer's Stargazing, page 385. Thus, that inscrutable mode of force, heat, traverses the depth of space, reaches the earth, and turns the delicate balance of the thermopile. Another discovery was made with the spectroscope thus. If a boat moves up a river, it will meet more waves than will strike it if going downstream. Light is the undulation of waves. Hence, if the spectroscope is set on a star that is approaching the Earth, more waves will enter than if set on a receding star, which fact is known by displacement of lines in the spectroscope from normal positions. It is found that many fixed stars are approaching while others are moving away from the solar system. We cannot note the researches of Edison, Lockyer, or Tyndall, nor of Crookes, who has seemingly reached the molecule whence the universe is composed. 
the modern observatory is a labyrinth of sensitive instruments, and when any disturbance takes place in nature, in heat, light, magnetism, or like modes of force, the apparatus note and record them. Men are by no means satisfied. Insatiable thirst to know more is developing into a fever of unrest. They are wandering beyond the limits of the known every day a little farther. They survey space and interrogate the infinite, measure the atoms of hydrogen, and weigh suns. Man takes no rest, and neither will he until he shall have found his own place in the chain of nature. Kansas Review End of section 20「Section 21 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9th, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement Number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. The Future Development of Electrical Appliances Professor J. Perry lately delivered a lecture on this subject at the Society of Arts, London, which contains in an epitomized form the salient points of the hopes and fears of the more sanguine spirits of the electrical world professor perry is one of the two professors who have been dubbed the japanese twins and whose insatiate love of work induced one of our most celebrated men of science to say that they caused the centre of experimental research to tend toward tokyo instead of london professors ayrton and perry have for some time been again resident in england but it is evident that they did not leave any of their energy in japan for those who know them intimately know that they are pursuing numerous original investigations and that so soon as one is finished another is commenced it would have been difficult then to have found an abler exponent of the future of electricity professor perry after referring to what might have been said of the great things physical science has done for humanity plunged into his subject the work to be done was vast and the workers altogether out of proportion to the task the methods of measurement of electricity are not generally understood perhaps when electricity is supplied to every house in the city at a certain price per horsepower and is used by private individuals for many different purposes this ignorance will disappear electrical energy is obtained in various ways but the generators get heated and one great object of inventors is to obtain from machines as much as possible electrical energy of the energy in the first place supplied to such machine the lecturer called particular attention to the difference between electricity and electrical energy and attempted to drive home the fundamental conceptions of electrical science by the analogies derivable from hydraulics a miller speaks not only of quantity of water but also of head of water the statement then of quantity of electricity is insufficient except we know the electrical property analogous to head of water and which is termed electrical potential a small quantity of electricity of high potential is similar to a small quantity of water at high level the analogies between water and electricity were collected in the form of a table shown on a wall sheet as follows we want to use water one steam pump burns coal and lifts water to a higher level 
we want to use electricity. 1. Generator burns zinc or uses mechanical power and lifts electricity to a higher level or potential. Water. 2. Energy available is amount of water lifted times difference of level. Electricity. 2. Energy available is amount of electricity times difference of potential. Water. 3. If we let all the water flow away through channel to lower level without doing work, its energy is all converted into heat because of frictional resistance of pipe or channel. Electricity. 3. If we let all the electricity flow through a wire from one screw of our generator to the other without doing work, all the electrical energy is converted into heat because of resistance of wire. Water. 4. If we let water work a hoist as well as flow through channels, less water flows than before. Less power is wasted in friction. Electricity. 4. If we let our electricity work a machine as well as flow through wires, less flows than before, less power is wasted through the resistance of the wire. Water. 5. However long and narrow may be the channels, water may be brought from distance, however great, to give out almost all of its original energy to a hoist. This requires a great head and small quantity of water. Electricity. 5. However long and thin the wires may be, electricity may be brought from any distance, however great, to give out almost all its original energy to a machine. This requires a great difference of potentials and a small current. The difference between potential and electromotive force was explained thus. Difference of potential is analogous with difference of pressure or head of water, howsoever produced, whereas electromotive force is analogous with the difference of pressure before and behind a slowly moving piston of the pump employed by an unfortunate miller to produce his water supply. Electricians have very definite ideas upon the subject they are working at and a special attention is paid to the measurements on which their work depends. Examples of these measurements were shown by the following tables on wall sheets. Electrical magnitudes, some rather approximate. Resistance of 1 yard of copper wire 1 eighth of an inch diameter, 0 0.002 ohms. Resistance of 1 mile ordinary iron telegraph wire, 10 to 20 ohms. Resistance of some of our selenium cells, 40 to 1 million ohms. Resistance of a good telegraph insulator, 4 trillion ohms. Electromotive force of a pair of copper iron junctions at a difference of temperature of 1 degree Fahrenheit. 0 0.0000 volts. Electromotive force of contact of zinc and copper, 0 0.75 volts. Electromotive force of one Daniels cell, 1.1 volts. Electromotive force of Mr. Latimer Clark's standard cell, 1.45 volts. Electromotive force of one of Dr. De La Hughes batteries, 11,000 volts. Electromotive force of lightning flashes, probably many millions of volts. Current measured by us in some experiments. Using electrometer, almost infinitely small currents. Current measured by us in some experiments using delicate galvanometer 0 0.0000000040 Weber. Current received from Atlantic cable when 25 words per minute are being sent 0 0.000001 Weber. 
current in ordinary land telegraph lines 0.003 Weber, current from dynamo machine 5 to 100 Weber. In any circuit, current in Webers equals electromotive force in volts divided by resistance in ohms. End of section 21. Section 22 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July the 9th, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July the 9th, 1881, by Various rate of production of heat calculated in the shape of horse power in the whole of a circuit equals current in webers times electromotive force in volts divided by seven hundred and forty six in any part of circuit equals current in webers times difference of potential at the two ends of the part of the circuit in question divided by seven hundred and forty six or equals square of current in Weber's times resistance of the part in ohms divided by 746. If there are a number of generators of electricity in a circuit whose electromotive forces in volts are E1, E2, and so on, and if there are also opposing electromotive forces F1, F2, and so on, volts, and if C is the current in Weber's, R the whole resistance of the current in ohms, P the total horsepower taken at the generators, Q the total horsepower converted into some other form of energy and given out at the places where there are opposing electromotive forces, H the total horsepower wasted in heat because of resistance, then... C equals the sum of E1 plus E2 plus etc. minus the sum of F1 plus F2 plus etc. all divided by R. P equals C times the sum of E1 plus E2 plus etc. all divided by 746. Q equals C times the sum of F1 plus F2 plus etc. all divided by 746. H equals C squared times R all divided by 746. The lifting power of an electromagnet of given volume is proportional to the heat generated against resistance in the wire of the magnet. The future of many electrical appliances depends on how general is the public comprehension of the lessons taught by these wall sheets. If a few capitalists in London would only spend a few days in learning thoroughly what these mean, electrical appliances of a very distant future would date from a few months hence. A number of experiments were shown in some of which electrical energy was converted into heat, in others into sound, in others into work. At this part of the lecture, reference was made to the work of Professor Ayrton and his pupils of Cowper Street, City and Guilds of London Institute classes. They measure, first, the gas consumed by the engine, second, the horsepower given to the dynamo machine, third, the current in the circuit in Weber's, and fourth, the resistance of the circuit. Thus, exact calculations can now be made as to the horsepower expended in any part of the circuit and the light given out in any given period by an electric lamp. The dynamometers used in these measurements were described, but at present, in some cases, the description given is for various reasons incomplete, so that we shall take a future opportunity of writing of these instruments. To measure the light, 
a photometer constructed by professors Ayrton and Perry is used, which obviates the necessity of large rooms and enables the operator to give the intensity in a very short period of time. A number of measurements of the illuminating power of an electric lamp were rapidly made during the lecture with this photometer. By means of a small dynamo machine driven by an electric current generated in the Adelphi arches, a ventilator, a sewing machine, a lathe, and so on, were driven. In the latter, a piece of wood was turned. What, said the lecturer, do these examples show you? They show that if I have a steam engine in my back yard, I can transmit power to various machines in my house. But if you measure the power given to these machines, you would find it to be less than half of what the engine driving the outside electrical machine gives out. Further, when we wanted to think of heating of buildings and the boiling of water, it was all very well to speak of the conversion of electrical energy into heat. But now we find that not only do the two electrical machines get heated and give out heat, but heat is given out by our connecting wires. We have then to consider our most important question. Electrical energy can be transmitted to a distance and even to many thousands of miles, but can it be transformed at the distant place into mechanical or any other required form of energy nearly equal in amount to what was supplied? Unfortunately, I must say that hitherto the practical answer made to us by existing machines is no. There is always a great waste due to the heat spoken of above. But fortunately, we have faith in the measurements of which I have already spoken, in the facts given us by Joule's experiments and formulated in ways we can understand. And these facts tell us that in electric machines of the future and in their connecting wires, there will be little heating and therefore little loss. We shall, I believe, at no distant date, have great central stations possibly situated at the bottom of coal pits where enormous steam engines will drive enormous electric machines. We shall have wires laid along every street, tapped into every house as gas pipes are at present. We shall have the quantity of electricity used in each house registered as gas is at present, and it will be passed through little electric machines to drive machinery to produce ventilation, to replace stoves and fires, to work apple pears and mangles and barber's brushes, among other things, as well as to give everybody an electric light. It is possible, as Professor Ayrton first showed in his Sheffield lecture, that electrical energy can be transmitted through long distance by means of small wires, and that the opinion that wires of enormous thickness would be required is erroneous. The desideratum required was good insulation. He also showed that instead of a limiting efficiency of 50%, the only thing preventing our receiving the whole of our power was the mechanical friction which occurs in the machines. He showed, in fact, how to get rid of electrical friction. A machine at Niagara receives mechanical power and generates electricity. Call this the generator. Let there be wires to another electric machine in New York, which will receive electricity and give out mechanical work. Now, this machine, which may be called the motor, produces a back electromotive force, and the mechanical power given out is proportional to the back electromotive force multiplied into the current. The current, which is of course the same at Niagara as at New York, is proportional to the difference of the two electromotive forces, and the heat wasted is proportional to the square of the current. You see from the last table that we have the simple proportion, power utilized is to power wasted, as the back electromotive force of the motor is to the difference between electromotive forces of generator and motor. This reason is very shortly, and yet very exactly, given as follows. Let electromotive force of generator be E of motor F, 
let total resistance of circuit be r then if we call p the horsepower received by the generator at niagara q the horsepower given out by motor at new york that is utilized h the horsepower wasted as heat in machines and circuit c the current flowing through the circuit c equals e minus f all divided by r p equals e times the difference of e minus f all divided by 746 times r q equals f times the difference of e minus f all divided by 746 times r h equals the difference of e minus f squared all divided by 746 times r q is to h as f is to the difference of e minus f the water analogy was again called into play in the shape of a model of the better demonstration of the problem the defects in existing electric machines and the means of increasing the emf were discussed the conclusions pointing to the future use of very large machines and very high velocities the future of telephonic communications received a passing remark and attention called to the future of electric railways the small experiments of siemens have determined the ultimate success of this kind of railway their introduction is merely a question of time and capital the first cost of electric railways would be smaller than that of steam railways the working expenses would also be reduced the rails would be lighter the rolling stock lighter the bridges and viaducts less costly and in the underground railways the atmosphere would not be vitiated Quote, about two years ago it struck Professor Arton and myself, when thinking how very faint musical sounds are heard distinctly from the telephone, in spite of loud noises in the neighborhood, that there was an application of this principle of recurrent effects of far more practical importance than any other, namely, in the use of musical notes for coast warnings in thick weather. You will say that fog bells and horns are an old story, and that they have not been particularly successful since, in some states of the weather, they are audible, in others not. Now, it seems to be forgotten by everybody that there is a medium of communicating with a distant ship, namely the water, which is not at all influenced by changes in the weather. At some twenty or thirty feet below the surface, there is exceedingly little disturbance of the water, although there may be large waves at the surface suppose a large water siren like this experiment shown is working at as great a depth as is available off a dangerous coast the sound it gives out is transmitted so as to be heard at exceedingly great distances by an ear pressed against a strip of wood or metal dipping into the water if the strip is connected with a much larger wooden or metallic surface in the water the sound is heard much more distinctly now the sides of a ship form a very large collecting surface and at the distance of several miles from such a water siren as might be constructed we feel quite sure that above the noise of engines and flapping sails above the far more troublesome noise of waves striking the ship's side the musical note of the distant siren would be heard giving warning of a dangerous neighborhood in considering this problem you must remember that messrs Caledon and stern heard distinctly the sound of a bell struck under water at the distance of nearly nine miles the sound being communicated by the water of lake geneva End quote. the next portion of the lecture discussed the great value of a rapid recurrence of effects the obtaining of sound by means of a rapid intermission of light rays and selenium joined up in an electric circuit being instanced as an example then recent experiments on the refractive power of ebonite were detailed the rough results tending to give greater weight to clark maxwell's electromagnetic theory of light the index of refraction of ebonite was found by professors ayrton and perry to be roughly one point seven 
Clark-Maxwell theory requires that the square of this number should be equal to the electric-specific inductive capacity of the substance. For ebonite, this electric constant varies from 2.2 to 3.5 for different specimens, the mean of which is almost exactly equal to the square of 1.7. End of section 22. Section 23 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ken Kowalik. Researches on the Radiant Matter of Crookes and the Mechanical Theory of Electricity by Dr. W. F. Gintel, abstracted by Dr. von der Richten. The author discusses the question whether, according to the experiment of Crookes, the assumption of an essential force state of aggregation is necessary, or whether the facts may be satisfactorily explained without such hypothesis. He shows that the latter alternative is possible with the aid of a mechanical theory of electricity. If the radiant matter produced in the vacuum is a phenomenon sui generis, produced by the action of electricity and heat upon the molecules of gas remaining in the receiver, it is, in the first place, doubtful to apply to it the conception of an aggregate condition. The author considers it impossible to form a clear understanding of the phenomena in accordance with the theory of Crookes, or to find in the facts any evidence of the existence of radiant matter. An explanation of the latter phenomenon is thus given. Particles become separated from the surface of the substance of the negative pole. They are repelled, and they move away from the pole with the speed resulting from the antagonistic forces in a parallel and rectilinear direction, preserving their speed and their initial path so long as they do not meet with obstacles which influence their movement. At a certain density of the gases present in the exhausted space, these particles, in consequence of the impact of gaseous molecules more or less opposed to their direction of movement, lose their velocity after traveling a short distance and soon come to rest. The more dilute the gas, the smaller is the number of the impact of the gaseous molecules encountering the molecules of the poles, and at a certain degree of dilution, the repelled polar particles will be able to traverse the space open to them without any essential alteration in their speed. The small number of the existing gaseous molecules, being no longer able to retard the molecules of the polar nor their journey through the apparatus, the luminous phenomena of the Geissler tubes, the author supposes to be produced by the intense blows which the gaseous molecules receive from the polar molecules flying rapidly through the apparatus. The intensity of the luminous phenomena will naturally decrease with the number of the photophosphorus particles occupying the space. Accordingly, in the experiments of Crookes on continued rarefraction of the gas, a condition was reached where a display of light is no longer perceptible or can be made visible merely by the aid of fluorescent bodies. A condition may also appear, as is shown by Crookes' experiment, with the metallic plate intercalated as negative pole in the middle of a Geissler tube, with the positive poles at the ends. In this case, gaseous molecules are, so to speak, driven away by the polar particles endowed with an equal initial velocity, till at a certain distance from the pole, the mass of the gaseous molecules and their speed become so great that a luminous display begins. In an analogous manner, the author explains the phenomena of the phosphorescence which Crookes elicits by the action of his radiant matter. In like manner, the thermic and mechanical effects are most simply explained, according to the expression selected by Crookes himself, as the results of a continued molecular bombardment, the attraction of the so-called radiant matter, regarded as a stream of metallic particles by the magnet, will not appear surprising. End of section 23. Read by Ken Kowalik, April 26, 2023. Read at Ontario, Canada.
Section 24 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in April 2023. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Economy of the Electric Light. Mr. W. H. Preece writes to the Journal of Arts as follows. At the South Kensington Museum, very careful observations have been made on the relative cost of the two systems, that is, gas and electricity. The court lighted is that known as the Lord President's, or the Lone Court. It is 138 feet long by 114 feet wide and has an average height of about 42 feet. It is divided down the middle lengthwise by a central gallery. There are cloisters all around it on the ground floor, and the walls above are decorated in such a way that they do not assist in the reflection or diffusion of the light. The absence of a ceiling, the court being skylighted, is to some extent compensated for by drawing the blinds under the skylights. The experiments commenced about twelve months ago with eight lamps only on one side of the court. The system was that of brush. The dynamo machine was driven by an eight-horsepower auto gas engine supplied by Messrs. Crossley. The comparison with the gas was so much in favor of electricity and the success of the experiment so encouraging that it was determined to light up the whole court. The gas engine, which was not powerful enough, was replaced by a 14-horsepower semi-portable steam engine by Ransoms and Company of Ipswich, an engine of sufficient power to drive double the required number of lights. The dynamo machine is a number 7 brush. There are 16 lamps in all, 8 on each side of the court. The machine has given no trouble whatever, and it has, as yet, shown no signs of wear. The lamps were not all good, and it was found that they required careful adjustment, but when once they were got to go right, they continued to do so, and have, up to the present, shown no signs of deterioration, although the time during which they have been in operation is nine months. The first outlay has been as follows. Engine and fixing, including shafting and belting, £420. Dynamo machine, £400. Lamps, apparatus and conducting wire, £384. Total, £1,204. The cost of working has been, from June 22nd to December 31st, during which period the lights were going on 87 nights for a total time of 359 hours. Carbons, 18 pounds, 9 shillings. Oil, etc., 4 pounds, 11 shillings, 6 pence. Coal, 11 pounds, 14 shillings. Wages, 34 pounds, 7 shillings, 6 pence. Total, 69 pounds, 2 shillings being at the rate of three shillings ten pence per hour of light. Now the consumption of gas in the court would have been 4,800 cubic feet per hour, which, at three shillings four pence per 1,000 cubic feet, would amount to 16 shillings per hour, thus showing a saving of working expenses of 12 shillings two pence per hour, or, since the museum is lit up for 700 hours every year, a total saving at the rate of £426 per annum. In estimating the cost as applied to this court, only half the cost of the engine should be taken, for a second dynamo machine has lately been added to light up some of the picture galleries and the life room of the art school. The capital outlay should, therefore, be £994. In making a fair estimate of the annual cost, we should also allow something for a percentage on capital and something for wear and tear. Take 5% on the capital, £49.10. 5% 10 for wear and tear of electrical apparatus, £39. 
5% for depreciation of engines, etc., 21 pounds. Total, 109 pounds, 10 shillings. Leaving a handsome balance to the good of 316 pounds, 10 shillings, as against gas. The results of the working, both practically and financially, have proved to be, at South Kensington, a decided success. I am indebted to Colonel Festing, R.E., who has charge of the lighting, for these details. The same comparison cannot be made at the British Museum, for no gas was used in the reading room before the introduction of the electric light, but the cost of lighting has proved to be five shillings sixpence per hour, at least one-third of that which would be required for gas. The system in use at the museum is Siemens, the engine being by Wallace and Stevens of Basingstoke. An excellent example of economic electric lighting is that of Messrs. Henry Tate and Sons, Sugar Refinery, Silvertown. A small tangy engine, placed under the supervision of the driver of a large engine of the works, drives an A-size Gram machine, which feeds a Crompton E lamp. This is hung at a height of about 12 feet from the ground in a single-story shed, about 80 feet long and 50 feet wide, and having an open trussed roof. The light, placed about midway, lengthwise, has a flat canvas frame, forming a sort of ceiling directly over it, to help to diffuse the illumination. The whole of the shed is well lit, and the large quantity of light also penetrates into an adjoining one of similar dimensions, and separated by a row of columns. The light is used regularly all through the night, and has been so all through the winter. Messrs. Tate speak highly of its efficiency. To ascertain the exact cost of the light, as well as of the gas illumination which it replaced, a gas meter was placed to measure the consumption of the gas through the jets affected, and also the carbons consumed by the electric illumination were noted. A series of careful experiments showed that during a winter's night of 14 hours duration, the illumination by electricity cost one shilling nine pence, while that by gas was three shilling sixpence, or one and a half pence per hour against three pence per hour. To this must be added the greatly increased illumination, four to five times, given by the electric light, to the benefit of the work. While this last illuminant also allowed, during the process of manufacture of the sugar, the delicate gradations of tint to be detected, and so to avoid those mistakes, sometimes costly ones, liable to arise through the yellow tinge of gas illumination. This alone would add much to the above-named economy arising from the use of electric illumination in sugar works. I am indebted for these facts to Mr. J. N. Shawlbred, under whose supervision the arrangements were made. Some excellent experience has been gained at the shipbuilding docks in Barrow in Furness, where the brush system has been applied to illuminate several large sheds covering the punching and shearing machinery, bending blocks, furnaces, and other branches of this gigantic business. In one shed, which was formerly lighted by large blast lamps in which torch oil was burnt, costing about five pence per gallon, and involving an expenditure of eight pounds nine shillings per week, the electric light has been adopted at an expenditure of four pounds fourteen shillings per week. The erecting shop, 450 feet by 150 feet, formerly dimly lit by gas at a cost of twenty-two pounds per week, is now efficiently lit by electricity at half the cost. I am indebted for these facts to Mr. Humphreys, the manager of the works. The post office authorities have contracted with Mr. M. E. Crompton to light up the post office at Glasgow for the same price as they have hitherto paid for gas, and there is no doubt that in many instances this arrangement will leave a handsome profit to the electric light company. They are about to try the Brocky system in the telegraph galleries and the brush system in the newspaper sorting rooms of the general post office in St. Martin's Le Grand. End of section 24.
Section 25 of Scientific American Supplement Number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Scientific American Supplement Number 288, July 9, 1881. By Various. On the Space Protected by a Lightning Conductor by William Henry Preece Footnote From the Philosophical Magazine for December 1880 Any portion of non-conducting space disturbed by electricity is called an electric field. At every point in this field, if a small electrified body were placed there, there would be a certain resultant force experienced by it dependent upon the distribution of electricity producing the field. When we know the strength and direction of this resultant force, we know all the properties of the field, and we can express them numerically or delineate them graphically. Faraday, EXP, RES, 3122, ET, SEQ, showed how the distribution of the forces in any electric field can be graphically depicted by drawing lines, which he called lines of force, whose direction at every point coincides with the direction of the resultant force at that point. And Clerk Maxwell, C-A-M-B, P-H-I-L, T-R-A-N-S, 1857, showed how the magnitude of the forces can be indicated by the way in which the lines of force are drawn. The magnitude of the resultant force at any point of the field is a function of the potential at that point, and this potential is measured by the work done in producing the field. The potential at any point is, in fact, measured by the work done in moving a unit of electricity from the point to an infinite distance. Indeed, the resultant force at any point is directionally proportional to the rate of fall of potential per unit length along the line of force passing through that point. If there be no fall of potential, there can be no resultant force. Hence, if we take any surface in the field such that the potential is the same at every point of the surface, we have what is called an equipotential surface. The difference of potential between any two points is called an electromotive force. The lines of force are necessarily perpendicular to the surface. When the lines of force and the equipotential surfaces are straight, parallel, and equidistant, we have a uniform field. The intensity of the field is shown by the number of lines passing through unit area, and the rate of variation of potential by the number of equipotential surfaces cutting unit length of each line of force. Hence, the distances separating the equipotential surfaces are a measure of the electromotive force present. Thus, an electric field can be mapped or plotted out so that its properties can be indicated graphically. Figure 1. The air in an electric field is in a state of tension or strain, and this strain increases along the lines of force with the electromotive force producing it until a limit is reached, when a rent or split occurs in the air along the line of least resistance, which is disruptive discharge or lightning. Figure 2. Since the resistance of the air or any other dielectric opposes to this breaking strain is thus limited, there must be a certain rate of fall of potential per unit length which corresponds to this resistance. It follows, therefore, that the number of equipotential surfaces per unit length can represent this limit, or rather the stress which leads to disruptive discharge. Hence, we can represent this limit by a length. We can produce disruptive discharge either by approaching the electrified surfaces producing the electric field near each to each other, or by increasing the quantity of electricity present upon them, for in each case we should increase the electromotive force and close up, as it were, the equipotential surfaces beyond the limit of resistance. Of course, this limit of resistance varies with every dialectic, but we are now dealing only with air at ordinary pressures. It appears from the experiments of Drs. Warren de la Rue and Hugo Mueller 
that the electromotive force determining disruptive discharge in air is about 40,000 volts per centimeter, except for very thin layers of air. Figure 3. If we take into consideration a flat portion of the Earth's surface, A, B, figure 1, and assume a highly charged thundercloud, C, D, floating at some finite distance above it, they would, together with the air, form an electrified system. There would be an electric field, and if we take a small portion of this system, it would be uniform. The lines AB, A1B1, would be lines of force, and CD, C1D1, C2D2, would be equipotential planes. If the cloud gradually approached the Earth's surface, figure 2, the field would become more intense. The equipotential surfaces would gradually close up, the tension of the air would increase until at last the limit of resistance of the air, EF, would be reached. Disruptive discharge would take place with its attendant thunder and lightning. We can let the line EF represent the limit of resistance of the air if the field be drawn to scale and we can thus trace the conditions that determine disruptive discharge. Figure 4. If the Earth's surface be not flat, but have a hill or a building, as H or L, upon it, then the lines of force and the equipotential planes will be distorted, as shown in Figure 3. If the hill or building be so high as to make the distance H, H, or L, L, equal to EF figure 2, then we shall again have disruptive discharge. If instead of a hill or building we erect a solid rod of metal, GH, then the field will be distorted as shown in figure 4. Now it is quite evident that whatever the relative distance of the cloud and earth, or whatever be the motion of the cloud, there must be a space, G, G1, along which the lines of force must be longer than A1A or HH, and hence there must be a circle described around G as a center, which is less subject to disruptive discharge than the space outside the circle, and hence this area may be said to be protected by the rod GH. The same reasoning applies to any equipotential plane, and as each circle diminishes in the radius as we ascend, it follows that the rod virtually protects the cone of space whose height is the rod and whose base is the circle described by the radius g a. It is important to find out what this radius is. Figure 5. Let us assume that a thundercloud is approaching the rod a b figure 5 from above, and that it has reached a point d1 where the distance d1b is equal to the perpendicular height d1c1. It is evident that, if the discharge at d be increased until the striking distance be attained, the line of discharge will be along d1c or d1b, and that the length ac1 is under protection. Now nearer the point d1 is to d, the shorter will be the length AC1 under protection, but the minimum length will be AC, since the cloud would never descend lower than the perpendicular distance DC. Supposing, however, that the cloud had actually descended to D when the discharge took place, then the latter would strike to the nearest point, and any point within the circumference of the portion of the circle BC, whose radius is db, would be at a less distance from d than either the point b or the point c. Hence, a lightning rod protects a conic space whose height is the length of the rod, whose base is a circle having its radius equal to the height of the rod, and whose side is the quadrant of a circle whose radius is equal to the height of the rod. I have carefully examined every record of accident that was available, and I have not yet found one case where damage was inflicted inside this cone when the building was properly protected. There are many cases where the pinnacles of the same turret of a church have been struck 
where one has had a rod attached to it, but it is clear that the other pinnacles were outside of the cone, and therefore for protection. Each pinnacle should have its own rod. It is evident also that every prominent point of a building should have its rod, and that the higher the rod, the greater is the space protected. End of section 25. Section 26 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Photoelectricity of Fluor Spar Crystals Hansel has communicated to the Saxon Royal Society of Science some interesting observations on the production of electricity by light in colored fluor spar. The centers of the fluor spar cubes become negatively electric by the action of light. The electric tension diminishes towards the edges and angles, and frequently positive polarity is produced there. With very sensitive crystals, a short exposure to daylight is sufficient. By a long exposure to light, the electric current increases. The direct rays of the sun act much more powerfully than diffused daylight, and the electric carbon light is more powerful even than sunlight. The photoelectric action of light belongs principally to the chemically active rays. This is shown by the fact that the production of electricity is extremely small behind a glass colored with cuprous oxide and behind a film of a solution of quinine sulfate, while it is not appreciably diminished by a film of a solution of alum. The photoelectric excitability of fluor spar crystals is increased by a moderate heat, from 80 to 100 degrees centigrade. The Aurora Borealis and Telegraph Cables the January and February numbers of the Elektrotechnische Zeitschrift contain a number of articles on this interesting subject by several eminent electricians. Professor Förster, director of the observatory in Berlin, points out the great importance of the careful study of earth currents, first observed at Greenwich, and now being investigated by a committee appointed by the German government. He further points out, according to Professor Wykander of Lunt in Sweden, that a close connection exists between earth currents, the protuberances of the sun, and the aurora borealis, and that the nearly regular periodical reappearance of protuberances in intervals of 11 years coincides with similar periods of excessive magnetic earth currents and the appearance of the aurora borealis. The remarkable, disturbing influences on telegraph wires and cables of the Aurora Borealis, observed from the 11th to 14th of August, 1880, have been carefully recorded by Herr Geheim Postnat Ludwig in Berlin, and a map of Europe compiled, showing the places affected with the extent to which telegraph wires and cables were influenced and disturbed. Although the Aurora was but faintly visible in England and Germany, and in Russia only as far as 35 degrees north, disturbing influences were reported from all parts of Europe, the Mediterranean and Africa, and even Japan and the east coast of Asia. As far south as Zanzibar, Mozambique, and natal disturbances were also noticed. They were in Europe most intense on the morning of August 12th, when they lasted the whole day and increased again in intensity toward 8 o'clock in the evening while they suddenly ceased everywhere almost simultaneously. Scientific and careful observations were only taken at a few places, but the existence of earth currents in frequently changing direction and varying intensity was noticed everywhere. Long lines of wires were more affected than short ones, and although some lines, for instance, the Berlin-Hamburg in an east-west direction, were not at all influenced, no general law was noticed according to which certain directions were freed from the disturbing influence. While, for instance, the Red Sea cable was not noticeably affected, the land line to Bombay, forming a continuation of this cable, was materially disturbed. 
the marseilles algier cable so seriously influenced in eighteen seventy one showed no signs at all but as may be expected the north of europe suffered more than the south and in nystad finland the galvanometer indicated an intensity of current equal to that of two hundred le Clanche cells since thunderstorms are generally local it is only natural that their effect upon telegraph cables should also be confined to one locality numerous careful observations carried out over considerable periods of time show that the disturbing influences of thunderstorms on telegraph lines are of less duration and more varying in direction and intensity than those of the aurora borealis long lines suffer less than short lines telegraph wires above ground are more easily and more intensely affected than underground cables it is however possible that this is mainly due to the fact that in the districts where strict records were kept in the german empire most of the long lines are underground cables while most of the short local lines are overground wires the results of the disturbances varied in hughes apparatus the armatures were thrown off lines in operation indicated wrong signs dots became dashes and the spaces were either multiplied in size or number according to the direction of the earth currents induced by the thunderstorms since these observations extended over nearly two thousand cases some conclusions might fairly be drawn from them for the purpose of a more complete knowledge on the subject dr weikander recommends a series of regular observations on earth currents to be carried out at different stations well distributed over the whole surface of the globe these observations to be made between six and eight a m and at the same time in the evening special arrangements to be made at various stations to record exceptionally intense disturbances during the phenomena of the aurora borealis notice to be taken of time direction intensity and all further particulars since this question appears to bear a considerable amount of influence on underground cables it is one that deserves serious attention before earth cables are more generally introduced there can however be little doubt that they are not nearly so much exposed as overhead wires to disturbing influences of other kinds such as snow rain wind etc while they certainly do suffer though perhaps in a less degree by electrical disturbances engineering end of section 26 read by michael shane craig lambert lc toulouse france section 27 of scientific american supplement number 288 july 9 1881 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by piotr natter scientific american supplement number 288 july 9 1881 by various the photographic image what it is by thomas h morton m d a communication to the sheffield photographic society in the british journal of photography it is quite possible that in the remarks i propose making this evening in connection with the photographic art i may mention topics and some details which are familiar to many present but as chemistry and optical and physical phenomena enter largely into the theory and practice of photography the field is so extensive there is always something interesting and suggestive even in the rudiments especially to those who are commencing their studies although this paper may be considered an introductory one i do not wish to load it with any historical account or describe the early methods of producing a light picture but shall at once take for my subject the photographic image what it is and under this heading i must restrict myself to the collodion and silver or wet process leaving gelatin dry plates collodio chloride platinum carbon type and the numerous other types which are springing up in all directions for future consideration now in an ordinary pencil pen and ink or sepia sketch we have a deposit of a dark non-reflecting substance which gives the outline of a figure on a lighter background the different gradations of shade are acquired by a more or less deposit of lead ink or sepia 
in photography at least in the ordinary silver process the image is formed by a deposition of metallic silver or organic oxide in a minute state of division either on glass paper or other suitable material this is brought about by the action of light and certain reagents light has long been recognized as a motive power comparable with heat or electricity its action upon the skin fading of colors and effect on the growth of vegetable and animal organisms are well known and although the exact molecular change in many instances is not clearly understood yet certain salts of silver iron the alkaline bichromates and some organic materials as bitumen and gelatin have been pretty well worked out it is a remarkable and well-known fact that the chloride iodide and bromide of silver called sensitive salts in photography are not susceptible at least only slowly to change when exposed to the yellow orange and red rays the longer wavelengths of the spectrum as you know form with violet indigo blue and green white light the diagram on the wall shows this dispersion and separation of the primitive colors these the yellow orange and red are called technically non-actinic rays and the others in their order become more actinic until the ultraviolet is reached the action of white light or rays excluding yellow orange and red has the effect of converting silver chloride into a subchloride it drives off one equivalent of chlorine thus silver chloride ag2 cl2 equals ag2 cl plus cl when water is present the water is decomposed hydrochloric acid hcl hypochlorous acid hclo is formed the iodide of silver in like manner is changed into a sub iodide but with water hydriodic acid is formed unless an iodine absorbent be present then in hypoiodic acid the silver bromide undergoes a similar change when with light alone a sub bromide ag2br2 equals ag2br plus br and with water hypobromous acid it is important to bear this in mind as one or other and frequently both iodide and bromide of silver is the sensitive salt requisite or used in producing the invisible image the theory regarding this sensitive salts of silver is that being very unstable i e ready to undergo a molecular change the undulations produced in the ether which pervades all space and the potential action or moving power of light is sufficient to disturb their normal chemical composition it liberates some of the chlorine iodine or bromine as the case may be this action of course applies to light from any source the sun electricity or the brighter carbocarbons also flame from gas or candle whether it comes direct as rays of white light or is reflected from an object and conducted through a lens as a distinct image upon the screen of a camera i have no time to speak on the subject of lenses only just to mention that they are or ought to be achromatic so as to transmit white light and of perfect definition and the amount of light passed through should be as much as possible consistent with a sharp image at least when rapid exposure is attempted i shall touch very lightly on the manipulative part of photography as that would be unnecessary but a brief account of the chemicals in use is essential to a right appreciation of the theory of developing the image in the first place our object is to get a film of some suitable material coated with a thin layer of a sensitive salt of silver say a bromoiodide by mixing certain proportions of ammonium iodide and cadmium bromide or an iodide and bromide of cadmium with collodion which is pyroxyline a kind of gun cotton dissolved in ether and alcohol a plate of glass is coated and before being perfectly dry is immersed in the nitrate of silver bath the silver nitrate solution adhering and entering to a slight extent the surface of the collodion becomes converted by an ordinary chemical action of affinity into silver iodide and bromide the ammonium and cadmium play a secondary part in the process and are not absolutely necessary in forming the image the plate is now extremely sensitive to light when we have entered it into the dark slide and camera and then exposed to light the change i mentioned has taken place the film is transformed into different quantities of sub iodide and sub bromide of silver according to brilliancy of light 
In addition, there is on the plate an amount of unchanged silver nitrate, which becomes useful in the second stage, or development. The image is not seen as yet, being latent, and requiring the well-known developing solution of sulphate of iron, acetic acid, alcohol, and water. Practically, we all recognize the effect of a nicely balanced wave of developer worked round the plate. The highlights are first to appear as a darker color, till the details of shadow come out. When this is reached, the developer is washed off. The chemical action is briefly thus, and it can be shown by solutions without a photographic plate, as in a test tube. Pour into this glass a solution of silver nitrate, AgNO, and add a solution of ferrous sulfate, FeSO4. The ferrous sulfate combines with the nitric acid, forming two new salts, ferric nitrate and ferric sulfate. The silver is deposited. Any other substance which will remove oxygen from silver nitrate without combining with the silver would do the same, and metallic silver would be thrown down. The formula, as shown on the diagram, explains the interchange. When the developer is poured over the plate, it attacks first the silver nitrate and causes it to deposit extremely fine particles of metallic silver. The question arises, how is it these particles arrange themselves to form an image? This is explained by the physical movement known as molecular attraction or affinity. These particles are attracted first to the portions of the plate where there is most subiodide and subbromide. In the shady parts, less silver is deposited. When the image is once started, it follows that particles of silver produced by the iron developer will cause more to fall down on the face of these already present, and the image is, of course, built up, if the silver nitrate be all consumed on the plate. The developer then becomes useless or injurious. The presence of acetic acid checks the reduction of the silver, and the alcohol facilitates the flow when the bath becomes charged with ether and spirit. The molecular attraction just mentioned is made plainer by reference to the simple lead tree experiment. We have here, in this bottle, a piece of zinc rod introduced into a solution of acetate of lead. A chemical change has taken place. The zinc has abstracted the acetic acid, and the lead is deposited on the zinc, and will continue to be so until the solution is exhausted. The irregularities of surface and arborescent appearance are well shown. If the change were rapidly conducted, the lead particles would from their weight sink directly to the bottom instead of aggregating together like ordinary crystals. I have constructed a diagram of colored card, which will perhaps more clearly demonstrate the relation of the different constituents. The lower portion, figure A, represents a section of the glass plate or support. The collodion film, having upon its surface a thin layer of bromoiodine silver, which, when exposed to a well-lighted image, as in a camera, changes into different gradation of subbromide and subiodide, as indicated by irregular dark masses in the film. The dotted marks immediately above these are intended for the silver deposit. Clusters of granules, more abundant in the well-lighted and less in the shaded parts of the picture, corresponding to the amount of subbromide and iodide beneath. The next point to consider is that of intensification, a process seldom required in positive pictures and would not be needed so often in negatives if there was enough free silver nitrate on the plate during development. The object, as we all know, in a wet plate negative is to get good printing density without the destruction of half tone. It is a rule, I believe, in an overexposed picture to intensify after fixing the image and in an underexposed picture to intensify before fixing. Whichever is done, the intention is similar, namely to intercept in a greater degree the light passing through a negative, so as to make a whiter and cleaner print. The usual intensifier, and I suppose there is no better, is pyrogallic acid, citric acid, water, and a few drops of silver nitrate solution. Pyrogallic is the most active agent, and might be used alone with water, but for special reasons it is not desirable. As a chemical, it has a great affinity for oxygen, and will precipitate silver from a solution containing, for instance, nitrate of silver. It also combines with the metal, forming a pyrogallate, a dark brown, very non-actinic material. 
the use of a few drops of AgNO3 solution is very evident. A deposit is added to the image already formed. Citric acid is the retarder in this case. Alcohol is unnecessary, as the film is well washed with water before the intensifier is used, consequently it flows readily over the plate. As regards fixing, or more properly clearing the image, it is the simple action of dissolving out or from the film all free nitrate, chloride, iodide, or bromide. Cyanide of potassium does not attack the metallic deposit, unless very strong. It has then a tendency to reduce the details in the shadows. End of section 27 Section 28 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Gelatin Transparencies for the Lantern A Communication to the Photographic Society of Ireland Few of those who work with gelatin dry plates seem to be aware of the great beauty of the transparencies for lantern or other uses which can be made from them by ferrous oxalate development with the greatest ease and certainty. I think this is a very great pity, for I hold the opinion that the lantern furnishes the most enjoyable and, in some cases, the most perfect of all means of showing good photographic pictures. Many prints from excellent negatives which may be passed over in an album without provoking a remark will, if printed as transparencies and thrown on the screen, call forth expressions of the warmest admiration, and justly so, for no paper print can do that full justice to a really good negative which a transparency does. This difference is more conspicuous in these days of dry gelatin plates and handy photographic apparatus, when many of our most interesting negatives are taken on quarter or five by four plates, the small size of which frequently involves a crowding of detail, much of which will be invisible in a paper print, but which, when unraveled or opened out, as it were, by means of the lantern, enhances the beauty of the pictures immensely. When I last had the pleasure of bringing this subject before the members of our society, it may be remembered that I demonstrated the ease and simplicity with which those beautiful results may be obtained, by printing, in an ordinary printing frame, by the light of my petroleum developing lamp, raising one of its panes of ruby glass for the purpose for five seconds, and then developing by ferrous oxalate until I got the amount of intensity requisite. On that evening, in the course of a very just criticism by one of our members, Mr. J. V. Robinson, he pointed out what was undoubtedly a defect, namely, a slightly opalescent veiling of the highlights, which should range from absolutely bare glass in the highest points. He showed that, in consequence of this veiling, the light was sensibly diminished all over the picture. This veiling of the highlights was a serious disadvantage in another important particular, inasmuch as it lessened the contrast between the lights and shadows of the picture, thereby robbing it of some of its charm and deteriorating its quality. Since that evening I have endeavored, by a series of experiments, to find out some means by which this opalescence might be got rid of in the most convenient manner. Cementing the transparency to a piece of plain clear glass with candidal balsam, as suggested by Mr. Woodworth, I found in practice to be open to two formidable objections. One of these was that Canada balsam used in this manner is a sticky, unpleasant substance to meddle with, and takes a long time, nearly a month, to harden when confined between plates in this manner. The other objection was of extreme importance, namely, that in consequence of commercial gelatin plates not being prepared on perfectly flat glasses in all cases, I found that, after squeezing out the superfluous balsam and the air bubbles that might have formed from between the two plates, they are liable to separate at the places where the transparency is not flat, causing air bubbles to creep in from the edges, as you may see from the examples. 
I therefore have discarded this method, although it had the effect desired when successfully done. I have hit, however, upon another way of utilizing Canada balsam, which, while retaining all the good qualities of the former method, is not subject to any of its disadvantages. This consists in diluting the balsam with an equal bulk of turpentine and using it as a varnish, pouring it on like collodion, flowing it toward each corner, and pouring it off into the bottle from the last corner, avoiding crepey lines by slowly tilting the plate as in varnishing. If the plate be warmed previously, the varnish flows more freely and leaves a thinner coating of balsam behind on the transparency. When the plate has ceased to drip, place it in a plate drainer, with the corner you poured from lowest, and leave it where dust cannot get at it for four or five days, when it will be found sufficiently hard to be put into a plate box. The transparency may be finished at any time afterward by putting a clean glass of the same size along with it, placing one of the blank paper masks sold for the purpose, either circular or cushion-shaped to suit the subject, between the plates, and pasting narrow strips of thin black paper over the edges to bind them together. This method is very successful, as you may see from the examples. It renders the highlights perfectly clear and leaves a film like glass over all the parts of the transparency where the varnish has flowed. In order to avoid the risk of dust involved in this process, I tried other means of arriving at similar results and with success, for the plates I now submit to you have been simply rubbed or polished, as I may say, with a mixture of one part of Canada balsam to three parts of turpentine, using either a small tuft of French wadding or a small piece of soft rag for the purpose, continuing the rubbing until the plate is polished nearly dry. This method is particularly successful, rendering the clear parts of the sky like bare glass. I have here a plate which is heavily veiled, almost fogged in fact, one half of which I have treated in this way, showing that the half so treated is beautifully clear, while the other half is so veiled as to be apparently useless. I have tried to still further simplify this necessary clearing of those plates, and find that soaking for twelve hours in a saturated solution of alum, after washing the hypo out of the plate, is successful in a large number of cases, and where it is successful, there is no further trouble with the transparency, except to mount it after it becomes dry. Where it is not entirely successful, I put the plate into a solution of citric acid, four ounces to a pint of water, for about one minute, and have in nearly all cases succeeded in getting a beautifully clear plate. The picture must not be left long in the citric acid solution, or it will float off. Neither do I like using citric acid until after trying the alum for a similar reason. I may mention that I recommend a short exposure in the printing frame and slow development in order to get sufficient intensity. Of course, the exposure is always made to gas or petroleum light. I also still prefer the old method of making the ferrous oxalate solution, pouring it back into the bottle each time after using, and using it for two or three months, keeping the bottle full from a stock bottle, and occasionally putting a little dry ferrous oxalate into the bottle and shaking it up, allowing it to settle before using next time. By treating it in this way, it retains its power fairly well for a long time, and as it becomes less active, I give a little longer exposure, balancing one against the other. Making the ferrous oxalate solution from two saturated solutions of iron sulfate and potassium oxalate has not succeeded so well with me for transparencies. The tone of the picture is not so black as when developed by the old method, and I do not like grey transparencies for the lantern. I also recommend very slow gelatin plates, about twice as sensitive as wet collodion, not more, if I can help it. I have demonstrated, I hope to your satisfaction, the possibility of producing lantern slides from commercial gelatin plates of a most beautiful quality, ranging from clear glass to deep black, and giving charming gradation of tones, showing on the screen a film as structureless as albumin slides, without the great trouble involved in making them. You must not accept the slides put before you this evening as the best that can be done with gelatin. Far from it. 
they are only the work of an amateur with very little leisure now to devote to their manufacture and are merely the result of a series of experiments which so far as they have gone i now place before you thomas main t c in british journal of photography end of section twenty eight read by michael shane craig lambert l c toulouse france section twenty nine of scientific american supplement number two eighty eight july nine eighteen eighty one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Scientific American Supplement, Number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. An Integrating Machine, by C. V. Boys. All the integrating machines hitherto made, of which I can find any record, may be classed under two heads, one of which, Ainsley's machine, is the sole representative depending on the revolution of a disc which partly rolls and partly slides on the paper, and the other comprising all the remaining machines depending on the varying diameters of the parts of a rolling system. Now, none of these machines do their work by the method of the mathematician, but in their own way. My machine, however, is an exact mechanical translation of the mathematical method of integrating y dx, and thus forms a third type of instrument. The mathematical rule may be described in words as follows. Required the area between a curve, the axis of x, and two ordinates, it is necessary to draw a new curve such that its steepness, as measured by the tangent of the inclination, may be proportional to the ordinate of the given curve for the same value of x. Then the ascent made by the new curve in passing from one ordinate to the other is a measure of the area required. The figure shows a plan and side elevation of a model of the instrument, made merely to test the idea, and the arrangement of the details is not altogether convenient. The framework is a kind of T-square carrying a fixed center, B, which moves along the axis of X of the given curve. A rod passing always through B carries a pointer, A, which is constrained to move in the vertical line EE of the T-square. A then may be made to follow any given curve. The distance of B from the edge, EE, is constant. Call it K. Therefore, the inclination of the rod, AB, is such that its tangent is equal to the ordinate of the given curve divided by k. That is, the tangent of the inclination is proportional to the ordinate. Therefore, as the instrument is moved over the paper, AB has always the inclination of the desired curve. The part of the instrument that draws the curve is a three-wheeled cart of lead, whose front wheel, F, is mounted, not as a caster, but like the steering wheel of a bicycle. When such a cart is moved, the front wheel F can only move in the direction of its own plane, whatever be the position of the cart. If, therefore, the cart is so moved that F is in the line, EE, and at the same time has its plane parallel to the rod, AB, then F must necessarily describe the required curve, and if it is made to pass over a sheet of black tracing paper, the required curve will be drawn. The upper end of the T-square is raised above the paper and forms a bridge under which the cart travels. There is a longitudinal slot in this bridge in which lies a horizontal wheel, carried by that part of the cart corresponding to the head of a bicycle. By this means, the horizontal motion communicated to the front wheel of the cart by the bridge is equal to that of the pointer A. At the same time, the cart is free to move vertically. The mechanism employed to keep the plane of the front wheel of the cart parallel to AB 
is made clear by the figure. Three equal wheels at the ends of two jointed arms are connected by an open band, as shown. Now, in an arrangement of this kind, however the arms of the wheels are turned, lines on the wheels, if ever parallel, will also be so. If, therefore, the wheel at one end is supported that its rotation is equal to that of AB, while the wheel at the other end is carried by the fork which supports F, then the plane of F, if ever parallel to AB, will always be so. Therefore, when A is made to trace any given curve, F will draw a curve whose ascent is the product 1 over K, Fy, dx, and this, multiplied by k, is the area required. Not only does the machine integrate y dx, but if the plane of the front wheel of the cart is set at right angles instead of parallel to ab, then the cart finds the integral of dx over y, and thus solves problems, such for instance as the time occupied by a body in moving along a path when the law of the velocity is known. Some modifications of the machine already described will enable it to integrate squares, cubes, or products of functions, or the reciprocals of any of these. Of the various curves exhibited which have been drawn by the machine, the following are of special physical interest. Given the inclined straight line y equals cx, the machine draws the parabola y equals cx squared over 2. This is the path of a projectile as the space fallen is as the area of the triangle between the inclined line, the axis of x, and the traveling ordinate. Given the curve representing attraction y equals 1 over x squared, the machine draws the hyperbola y equals 1 over x. The curve representing potential as the work done in bringing a unit from an infinite distance to a point is measured by the area between the curve of attraction, the axis of x, and the ordinate at that point. Given the logarithmic curve y equals e exponent x, the machine draws an identical curve. The vertical distance between these two curves, therefore, is constant. If then, the head of the cart and the pointer A are connected by a link, this is the only curve they can draw. This motion is very interesting, for the cart pulls the pointer and the pointer directs the cart, and between they calculate a table of Napierian logarithms. Given a wave line, the machine draws another wave line a quarter of a wavelength behind the first in point of time. If the first line represents the varying strengths of an induced electrical current, the second shows the nature of the primary that would produce such a current. Given any closed curve, the machine will find its area. It thus answers the same purpose as Ainsley's polar planimeter, and though not so handy, is free from the defect due to the sliding of the integrating wheel on the paper. The rules connected with maxima and minima and points of inflection are illustrated by the machine, for the cart cannot be made to describe a maximum or a minimum unless the pointer, A, crosses the axis of X, or a point of inflection unless A passes a maximum or minimum. End of section 29. Read by John D. Parker. Section 30 of Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Scientific American Supplement, number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various. Upon a modification of Whetstone's microphone and its applicability to radiophonic researches. A paper read before the Philosophical Society of Washington, D.C., June 11, 1881, by Alexander Graham Bell. In August 1880, 
i directed attention to the fact that thin discs or diaphragms of various materials become sonorous when exposed to the action of an intermittent beam of sunlight and i stated my belief that the sounds were due to molecular disturbances produced in the substance composing the diaphragm shortly afterwards lord raleigh undertook a mathematical investigation of the subject and came to the conclusion that the audible effects were caused by the bending of the plates under unequal heating this explanation has recently been called in question by mr priest who has expressed the opinion that although vibrations may be produced in the discs by the action of the intermittent beam such vibrations are not the cause of the sonorous effects observed according to him the aerial disturbances that produce the sound arise spontaneously in the air itself by sudden expansion due to heat communicated from the diaphragm every increase of heat giving rise to a fresh pulse of air mr priest was led to discard the theoretical explanation of lord raleigh on account of the failure of experiments undertaken to test the theory he was thus forced by the supposed insufficiency of the explanation to seek in some other direction the cause of the phenomenon observed and as a consequence he adopted the ingenious hypothesis alluded to above but the experiments which had proved unsuccessful in the hands of mr priest were perfectly successful when repeated in america under better conditions of experiment and the supposed necessity for another hypothesis at once vanished i have shown in a recent paper read before the national academy of science that audible sounds result from the expansion and contraction of the material exposed to the beam and that a real to and fro vibration of the diaphragm occurs capable of producing sonorous effects it has occurred to me that mr priest's failure to detect with a delicate microphone the sonorous vibrations that were so easily observed in our experiments might be explained upon the supposition that he had employed the ordinary form of hughes microphone and that the vibrating area was confined to the central portion of the disc under such circumstances it might easily happen that both the supports of the microphone might touch portions of the diaphragm which were practically at rest it would of course be interesting to ascertain whether any such localization of the vibration as that supposed really occurred and i have great pleasure in showing to you tonight the apparatus by means of which this point has been investigated the instrument is a modification of the former microphone devised in 1872 by the late Sir Charles Whetstone, and it consists essentially of a stiff wire, one end of which is rigidly attached to the center of a metallic diaphragm. In Whetstone's original arrangement, the diaphragm was placed directly against the ear, and the free extremity of the wire was rested against some sounding body, like a watch in the present arrangement the diaphragm is clamped at the circumference like a telephone diaphragm and the sounds are conveyed to the ear through a rubber hearing tube the wire passes through the perforated handle and is exposed only at the extremity when the point was rested against the center of a diaphragm upon which was focused an intermittent beam of sunlight a clear musical tone was perceived by applying the ear to the hearing tube the surface of the diaphragm was then explored with the point of the microphone and sounds were obtained in all parts of the illuminated area and in the corresponding area on the other side of the diaphragm outside of this area on both sides of the diaphragm the sounds became weaker and weaker until at a certain distance from the center they could no longer be perceived at the point where we would naturally place the supports of a huge microphone no sound was observed we were also unable to detect any audible effects when the point of the microphone was rested against the support to which the diaphragm was attached the negative results obtained in europe by mr priest may therefore be reconciled with the positive results obtained in america by mr tainter and myself a still more curious demonstration of localization of vibration occurred in the case of a large metallic mass an intermittent beam of sunlight was focused upon a brass weight one kilogram and the surface of the weight was then explored with the microphone a feeble but distinct sound was heard upon touching the surface within the illuminated area and for a short distance outside but not in other parts in this experiment as in the case of the thin diaphragm absolute contact between the point of the microphone 
and the surface explored was necessary in order to obtain audible effects. Now, I do not mean to deny that sound waves may be originated in the manner suggested by Mr. Priest, but I think that our experiments have demonstrated that the kind of action described by Lord Raleigh actually occurs, and that it is sufficient to account for the audible effects observed. End of section 30. End of Scientific American Supplement number 288, July 9, 1881, by Various.